everyone. It is 10, 10 a.m. and we're getting... Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to City Hall. Welcome to Council Chambers and welcome to a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council for today, Tuesday, July 15th, 2003. The City Council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. Meetings are open to the public and we do invite you to join us. For members of the public unable to attend council meetings, we can be viewed live on your cable station, Channel 35. We can also be viewed live via webcast from the city's homepage or heard via council phone. Uh, it is nearly 10.15 a.m. and we have eight members present, too shy of a quorum. Uh, but this being Tuesday, as is customary, we have a few introductions and presentations uh, and a salute to the flag scheduled today. If I can ask a special guest in council chambers with us today, the Honorable Bert Bachman from the San Fernando Valley and police commissioner uh, to please lead us in a salute to the flag. Please stand. Please follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic 
for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And at this time, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Misikowski for a special presentation. If I can ask Bert Bachman to come back and join me. Members, today is really a historic day in this city, a sad one as well. We are going to be losing at least the official service, I hope not the unofficial service, that will continue I think for a long time to come, of Bert Bachman, who has served for more than 16 years on the Los Angeles Police Commission. And under rules that we've adopted in reforming the department, there is a requirement that at least since the Christopher Commission days, no commissioner can serve for more than 10 years or two five-year terms. And Bert has now met that requirement, a term limits of sorts, and is, uh, is stepping down from the police commission. But his, and obviously we can't ignore that, we can't ignore the past and what he has done. He was first appointed to the police commission by Mayor Tom Bradley. He was subsequently appointed to the police commission by Mayor Richard Reardon. And he has been reappointed to the police commission by Mayor James Hahn. And if you stop to think of the last 16 years uh, of the Los Angeles city history and the history within the police department, uh, you know that Bert has gone through some very, very interesting times with the city and the police department. He has actually overseen, as a member of the commission and one of the civilian bosses of the police department, the tenure of six police chiefs for the Los Angeles Police Department. And if there's one thing that I think everyone would agree to about Bert's service there is that he truly is the rock around which that commission and that department operate. He is steady. He is, I think, first and foremost, when you think of Bert, you think of the word integrity. He stands for that. He stands, stands solid. He has, stand, he has stood consistent. Um, in addition to that, and the, what the, the things that he has personally touched in that department in 16 years are too numerous to mention, but we have successfully, after a very, very, very long period of time, begun to critically review and renew the official police garage contracts and really bring to that a business sense and a business mind, as which Bert has helped do. He has helped work uh, on a de the department's deployment citywide to ensure, again, fairness and equity in terms of access to police services, to the police response calls. Um, he has uh, been monitoring and oversee and approving the major activities of the anti-terrorist division. Uh, there again, in his tenure on the police commission where he's served both as president and as vice president, I don't think there's a part of that police department that he hasn't touched. Beyond that, we all know Bert in his efforts uh, as a humanitarian and his, both with Jane and Bert, innumerable charitable efforts throughout this city, throughout this region. Uh, thousands of people today are better off because of the efforts of Bert and Jane Bachman in terms of their efforts at giving. With Bert, he has also not only been a member of the police commission doing what he needs to do officially there, but augmented that by helping to create and be a part of the police foundation, which helps get citizens and businessmen to contribute to even augment the budget of the police department for things that otherwise wouldn't be able to be afforded. And these are the kinds of things that have led not only to the safety of our communities, but the safety of our police officers. It really, um, it, I can't imagine the police commission without Bert there because for most of the period of time that I have been working through and with the police department and the police commission, Bert has always been that voice you go to. You hear controversy, you hear issues, you hear debate, but when you go to Bert, you'd know what the story was because he saw it all, he distilled it all. Actually, I don't know that I've ever seen him get seriously angry. Um, maybe, maybe he has, and I know he's got his family here, he's got um, current and uh, police commission members, he's got former police commission members, we have the chief of police, and I see we have a lot of the staff of the police commission. Uh, this man has touched all of us, every citizen in the city of L.A., 
both through his uh, activities, through his charities, but most importantly what we're recognizing him for today is his activities as police commission member, president, and vice president. And as I say, I know that the city and the police department are sorely, sorely going to miss him in that official capacity. And knowing Bert as I do, I, I am only consoled by the fact that I know that the unofficial capacity of service will, will stay there and we will all be beneficiaries of it. So Bert, it gives me great pride actually to be able to present this to you and say, words don't do it, but thank you so much in, in you. commending you for this uh, unbelievable tenure of service in this very, very difficult position through both difficult and good times. And thank you for that effort. Thank you very much. Before, before we hear from you, Bert, we have a couple of council members who also wish to say a few words. Let's begin by recognizing council member Zine. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues, uh, Bert, Jane, Radbo. It's, it's a sad day because of all the wonderful things you've done. And I've known you and your family for many, many years. I know your dedication to the people of Los Angeles. And I'll never forget the ride along we took in the Ford. It had a flat tire. And your connection with the community and your connection with the police department, and it doesn't seem that it's been that many years since you've been a police commissioner. But you've been there, you've been the rock of the police commission. I remember that you prided yourself in not being an attorney to bring common sense to the police commission. And many times when debates took place, and no disrespect to the attorneys on the police commission, Mr. David Cunningham, <laughs> but you were always the solid rock, common sense, logic, and bring about, not grandstanding, but bring about peace and tranquility through the tumultuous times that you've served on the police commission. I know as a former member of the department, the good you've done, and I recognize that, and I'm sure all the officers of the police department recognize you were the silent hero in many of those debates that took place in the police commission. I wish you and your family well. I know that your blessing on the new commissioner, your replacement, comes with your heart as your relationship with Alan has been very, very long. My relationship with him has been very, very long and very solid. And I know that he'll carry on with the integrity, with the determination, with the perseverance that you've really made in that police commission. And it's a tribute to you, and I'm honored to recognize you, Jane, who's uh, your lovely wife who's with you, and, and your sons, who I took to get your first driver's license with your mom. I keep remembering that, Bo. I still remember that. But the relationship has been solid, and the fact that we're honoring and recognizing you today, respect we have for you, and what you have done for the people of Los Angeles, all of Los Angeles, and for the members of the Los Angeles Police Department. I wish you well in your future endeavors. God bless you, Bert. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Zine, and uh, thank you for the words I heard on 1070 today as well. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I wanted to rise also to say um, congratulations, and uh, the City of Los Angeles owes you an incredible debt of gratitude. Uh, many people don't realize the hours, uh, the really the time away from your family that commissioners in Los Angeles um, do on a regular basis. This is our citizens' form of government. And while it could be criticized or, or blamed, um, it clearly is made up of people like you who uh, realize that they ought to want to be public servants. And that's what you've been, Bert. You've been a public servant. Uh, and you have been on a commission which clearly is at the forefront of what impacts the citizens of Los Angeles, and that's our police department. And it is much to your credit as it is to the mayors who saw in you uh, certainly the right kind of person to be on that commission. And you uh, uh, were first appointed by Mayor Bradley. Uh, Dick Reardon also saw your value, and I must say to the credit of the current mayor, uh, Jim Hahn, he also realized that you were the kind of person that should serve on this uh, extremely powerful and important uh, police commission. So I really do want to thank you, as well as the other members of the police commission who really do uh, step into harm's way <laughs> in uh, many ways uh, by agreeing to serve voluntarily on a commission uh, that is so important to the lives of, of Angelinos. Um, and I want to say that clearly you and Jane both um, 
uh, are also known throughout Los Angeles, and we also owe you a debt of gratitude for your work in charitable causes. Um, you have always uh, been so giving and so generous in the way that you have helped various causes uh, that, again, impact uh, so many people in Los Angeles, and we want to thank you for always uh, being compassionate and passionate about things that matter to people. And I have a special delivery message from Councilwoman Wendy Gruel, who could not be here, but her staff handed this to me. And she wanted to, from home, uh, with her new son, uh, to really extend her uh, gratitude to you and to say that uh, really one of the hallmarks of your career as a police commissioner has certainly been your support of uh, the rank and file police officers and that has really come through loud and clear and she as Cindy mentioned uh, she used the word integrity as a word that clearly defines who you are um, and she also wanted to, to us to know that uh, you have been a champion fighting for the San Fernando Valley and uh, that means a lot to a lot of people and that's certainly something you need to be recognized for and she says you work just as hard for charitable causes as you do for business interests. And that, again, is the makeup of a truly remarkable man. And uh, you have always had a present in civic discourse trying to improve our city. I can think of no greater words to be said about anyone who serves Los Angeles. Thank you, Bert, for your years of service. Uh, we really thank you. Thank you, and thank Wendy, too, very much. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think Wendy's second choice for her son's name was Bert, but she, had to, she got outvoted at home. Um, just want to congratulate you, Bert, and the entire Bachman family for your amazing service. And I know you've been a longtime friend to my family, too. And um, on behalf of myself and my father and my parents, I uh, wanted to thank you for being such a good friend and supporter over the years. Um, it's difficult to be a police officer. It's probably the toughest job we have in this city. But I think your service has made it a lot easier for those folks that are police officers because they know that somebody has had their back on the police commission, somebody who's looked out for their interests, and I want to thank you for that. You've been a civic leader, um, but you've also been a business leader, and I think that the amount of jobs that you've been able to create, I, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, not far from your dealerships. I've driven cars from your dealerships over the years, and really the amount of, of impact that you've had on our local economy is immeasurable. Uh, you've been a giant in terms of being able to make sure that the Valley and this region um, is leading in terms of all of its business activities and wanted to recognize and thank you for that as well as for your civic activism, your personal faith, your faith also in this city, even through challenging times. I know that, that deep down that you have that and uh, you certainly deserve uh, this retirement from uh, this, this uh, part of service in your life and we wish you well. God bless you and your family and thank you very much for everything that you've done for Los Angeles. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Bert and Jane, uh, and the other members of the Police Commission. Uh, it's nice to see all of you here, and it is hard to imagine that you will, can I say, you're actually not going to be a member of the Police Commission. I mean, it's, it's very hard for us uh, here, who have grown so used to your leadership, and, uh, and your, your patience and your diligence uh, to imagine a police commission without you. But I want to thank you for, um, in a sense, training and providing on-the-job training to the police commissioner who will replace you, who uh, is going to do you and Jane and everybody else on the commission proud, Mr. Scobin. Um, it's a real testament to your service on the commission that your legacy uh, is not just the legacy of the police department, but you've left us uh, a worthy successor and you've trained that successor. I just want to tell you one brief anecdote as you're on your way out the door. Um, I, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are in what I guess you could arguably call the police reform community. And when I first got on the council, uh, I asked them about the police commission. And one of these folks, uh, whom I respect more highly than almost any professional I know, said to me, look, the one person on that commission who always calls it straight, who always gets it right, is Bert Bachman. And when I heard that coming from someone 
whom I ideologically did not expect it to come from, uh, that was extraordinarily impressive to me. And over the past two years, I've had the chance to learn in person uh, exactly where that came from. Uh, you have my respect, my gratitude, and the respect and gratitude of this city. Thank you very much, Bert. Thank you, Jack, very much. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to give a rebuttal. I'm going to talk about Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I think, uh, Jane, you've done a, been a remarkable uh, mate that you have allowed Bert the time and the, the uh, energy to work in public service, even though you have a myriad of things to do. But I think what people don't realize, they may see you at the police commission, see you in a business atmosphere, but what they really need to see you is at the uh, uh, places in, in Mexico, whether it's the... Uh, uh, I have a mental block now, but our favorite places where Jane sits with her feet in the sand and uh, we go and eat the wild sauce. And so I'm just pleased that you are being honored. Uh, I didn't realize it was 16 years, but one thing we're not going to ever forgive you for or, or forget about is that you left us just before Rodney King and we think you caused that. Right after you left, it all exploded. But you told us that you had a vision <laughs> that something bad was going to happen. But uh, we're glad you came back, and we're pleased that you were the, the voice uh, in the LAPD about whether we're dealing with the uh, issues of uh, uh, the uh, yards in the sense of dealing with the, uh, a variety of things, the, the uh, consent decree, all those kind of business interests. And I always liked your comments in public and private session when you would say, I'm not an attorney, but... <laughs> The logic says this, and I think you always hit the point, and we've always appreciated, and I think the department appreciated your level hand, and so I just want to say thank you for those 16 years, and I'm sure you're not going to get out of the public service uh, area, area, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Chief. Bless you. We look forward to that Cabo house again. <laughs> Mr. Labonge. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. And Jane and Bert, congratulations. Uh, members, 49 years ago, this man started as a salesman at Galpin Ford. And through that time, through family, of raising his family, uh, but he also uh, raised the level of what should be of a citizen in serving their community. And it's not just his work on the police commission, which many have alluded to, but every place that I've ever gone, there's always Bert Bachman and Jane at a table, fully supporting a, a community activity in the San Fernando Valley at the Los Angeles Zoo or throughout Los Angeles. If you look in the dictionary and look at what would make a great father, uh, make a great husband, make a great business leader, would make a great police commissioner, you would see Bert Bachman. Because always as others have articulated, the level-headedness that is there. And it's the driving force of those who are level-headed that keep us who are one way or the other in line to be successful. So, Bert, I just want to congratulate you, and it's a pleasure serving you water wherever you are in the world or wherever you are in the city. Uh, you're truly a superstar, civic-minded, uh, committed business person, which is so important to have because you understand what the bottom line is about in things, is employing people. Uh, you're certainly a great commissioner. Uh, and I see Chief Bratton is here today to see the importance of your salute uh, and the importance of the transformation. As we say, it is sad that commissioners can't serve any longer when they're as special as you, Bert, but it was defined in such a way that allows for turnover. So your chair uh, will be a, a large chair to fill uh, by the person who is selected uh, to do that, but I think you know him, so that will make it even easier for to continue the continuity. Congratulations, Jane, to you and for all you've done for uh, Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley, and you, Bert, for all you've done for Los Angeles, San Fernando, and also for Ford, because uh, although I don't buy my cars from yours, I do buy from that company, because that company's committed to doing good things. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. It's an honor for me to speak a few words about your service, Bert, and also Jane and the family. You've given all these years of service and many of us, uh, to be frank, who dedicate our time publicly can't exactly figure out a way to keep the business going and also the public service. Well, you certainly have done so as your business straddles both the 6th and 7th Council District and you've grown tremendously. I had a wonderful conversation with an old high school friend of mine that I ran into when I was over at uh, 
your dealership the other day and who just loves it there and he feels as though he's found a home there. And the reason why I make that comment is because not everyone has it in them to be able to be a family man, to be able to be a business person and to be able to give the way you have given to this great city and the state of California. I heard your name many, many years ago when I was getting involved in politics and what I remember them saying that he, he's a big guy and in many ways you certainly are but I think that what you've proven and you are a pillar of an example for everybody who wants to be a public servant, every person who wants to be successful at whatever they do because you certainly have accolades in many, many, many areas is that you are a man with a corazón, you have a heart. And I know that because David isn't the only person that I know and grew up with who works for you. I've met many people that actually work for you and they have found a home and they really love it there. I just like to say that because it's very important for us to remember we wouldn't have a great city. We wouldn't have the resources that we have in government if it's not for businesses like you who find a way to be everything we need in a business and in a community and in a person. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for your service. And like Cindy just said, your informal service, I'm sure, will continue to go for many, many, many years. To you and your family, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. One, I didn't get the chance to know you as well as my colleagues. I've heard a lot about you throughout the years, but I wanted to thank you and the Police Commission for coming to Cypress Park. At the beginning of our term, my term, we were having a rash of killings in Northeast Los Angeles. At that time, we thought it was important to have the Police Commission come to Cypress Park and show the people that you really do care, that the Police Commission is not just an organization out there that makes decisions behind marble walls, and that you were there in the community, right there in Divine Savior Church, and we talked about the issues, we were talking about the gangs and, and how the parents and, and the moms and dads were being impacted by the loss of their kids and the dangers their kids go through. And the compassion you showed in the commissioners was very important to us. And for that, I'm very appreciative. Uh, I know Mr. Scobin is a person who is very uh, close to you and the group that you've been working with throughout the years. And I look forward to working with him. So for that, I thank you. It's not always true that a person of your stature in the valley doesn't understand what's happening in other parts of town. And for that, I'm grateful. So good luck to you. Thank you. I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I am, first of all, speaking on the residents of the 12th District, where Mr. Bachman has resided for so many years. And we go back to over 25 years, where we first met when, when Burt Bachman brought Galpin Ford, a small Ford dealership, to, to Roscoe Boulevard and began to grow uh, into a megalithic corporation that you now have. And that didn't happen by accident. That happened because you're a very smart man, you're a very driven man, you understood what the people of the Valley wanted, and that has been the driving force of what you have done throughout the life that I've known you over 25 years. You knew what the Valley wanted, you wanted to help the Valley, and you did it out of sincerity from your heart, not just in business, but in your community, and Jane certainly supporting you and her own activities too. You both have been such great leaders in the San Fernando Valley for so long, that's why you're both recipients of this Fernando Award. Uh, and that's why you, in 1975, when we first met in the, the original civic movement, were there because not because you hated the city of L.A., but because you thought there was better ways to do things for the San Fernando Valley. And certainly your involvement in the Valley independence movement was not misguided or driven out of hatred. It was driven out of love for the Valley which you live in, which you work in, and from which you really believe can be a better place to live. And so I think all of us salute you for your love of the Valley and your real care and concern about the city of LA. More importantly, what you've done on the police commission. I think the fact that you've served at the, the behest of three different mayors says so much about you as a man. A Republican, Democrat mayor, didn't matter. They wanted you there for a reason, and that was because you had a vision, you had an understanding, and true love and care for the people of this city and the San Fernando Valley as well. I know, speaking for my former boss, Mr. Bernson, that there were so many times then there are significant issues before the commission, whether they be internal issues within the police department or bigger issues tearing the entire city apart, that Burt Bachman was so often the guy we went to to negotiate to find consensus on the police commission, 
to bring us back together. And there were so many times the people don't even begin to know how often that was the case. I know that because I was fortunate to be there and see that. But Bert, you have been a leader in this city. You've been a leader in the valley. Jane, you've been a leader in the valley. Uh, on the police commission, you were there whenever we needed help. And there's been many times we've needed help. But the good thing is, I know that is today, you're not leaving us. You're just changing gears, because I know the Bachman family. And I know other family members are here today. I know that whenever we need the Bachman family involvement, you'll be there, because it's in your heart. That's where it really is for you folks. You really care about people. You care about doing the good thing and the right thing. And I don't think most people in the city begin to know what you do personally in the way of donations and your personal involvement in groups where they don't even see your name sometimes. But I know that so well. Uh, so I just congratulate you on your years of service to the city. But this is not closing the door. It's just opening a new door. And I'm so glad that you're still living in the 12th district and that we can count on you out there still fighting for the valley and also fighting for the people of the city of LA. God bless you for what you've done. And thank you for what I know you'll continue to do. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Folks, it sounds like a Burt Bachman for governor event. Uh -oh. With all this praise. I'm so seconded. <laughs> uh, before uh, hearing from our honored guest this morning, I just wanted to add a few words, much of which has already been said uh, in terms of appreciation. Uh, Bert, for your years of service uh, and contributions to the city, Lord knows where we'd be without you. Uh, but folks, I, I think the best way for me to sum it up is Bert is just a go-to guy when you think of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, if you're looking at any sort of significant business initiative or private sector initiative, uh, you go to Bert Bachman. And if you don't think you're going to Bert Bachman directly and you're going to an organization like the Valley Industry and Commerce Association or the Economic Alliance of the San Fernando Valley or the Chambers of Commerce, uh, you will soon learn and appreciate Bert's involvement uh, over the years with those institutions and the programs that are offered. Uh, something that all the members of this council can attest to. If you're thinking of running for office in the San Fernando Valley or in the region, uh, at any level of government, whatever side of the aisle you may find yourself on, uh, Bert Bachman uh, is a must in terms of going to pay your respect, going to visit. Uh, whether he supports you or not, he probably has some pretty good advice for you. Uh, and on the personal side, uh, clearly the Bachman family is one of uh, faith. Uh, and that shines through and through uh, from Bert as an individual and especially when you see the entire family standing together. Truly a model example uh, and uh, a true citizen and leader from the San Fernando Valley, but much, much greater than that. Bert, it's been an honor getting to know you. Uh, we know you're not going far away. The phone is always there and the horseless carriage is always there. And uh, we will continue to see you and visit with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's much appreciated, as I appreciate your leadership that you do give the city. So I thank you for that. I have, over the last 18 and a half years, served 16 and a half years with the finest police department in the world. I'm proud of them. I will always be supportive of them. I've been associated with five different chiefs during that period of time, and with uh, three, six. I have my counter here next to me. Uh, I think it's five. She thinks it's six, but whatever it is. And uh, three mayors during that period of time, and it's been wonderful. I've truly enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the department. I'm so proud of it. I just hope you're as proud as I am. And if you are, they're going to get the benefits that they need to, to have to do the job that's so important to all of us. So again, thank you for having me over. Thank you for your very kind words. Thank you, Ms. Misikowski, for that presentation. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Cardenas, Garcetti, Gruel, Hahn, Labange, Ludlow, Misikowski, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Smith, Villaragosa, Weiss, Zine, Padilla, 14 members present. The quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. The council is officially in session. 
Uh, we're going to go, colleagues, we're going to go through the agenda. I know several of you are taking pictures. We'll try to dispense with consent items at this time. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Ms. Misikowski moves and Mr. Park seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Ms. Perry moves and Mr. Garcetti seconds. Before beginning the regular agenda, there are several items that have been requested to be continued. Item number two, a request from the Department of Building and Safety to continue that matter to July 29th. Colleagues, we've received a request to continue item number two for two weeks to July 29th. Seeing no objection, item two is continued. And also a request to continue item number 40 for one day, July 16th. Colleagues, request to continue item number 40, also without objection. On the regular agenda, items noticed for public hearings, items one through five with the exception of two are building and safety confirmation of assessments. And I do have a card on item number three. We'll call that item special. On the balance of the items, I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council. Therefore, we shall deem the public hearings open and closed. Members wishing to call any specials, items one, four, or five. Any specials? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 aye. Those are approved. Next item, please. Next item is also a public hearing item. Yeah, item number six is confirmation of assessments for year 2000 brush clearance. I believe there are cards that have been submitted. Yes, we do have car speaker cards. We'll call this item special. And I believe Mr. Weiss has a request on one of the addresses uh, in, uh, contained in that. It's 8136 Gould Avenue, a request to continue that for two weeks. That's correct. I don't know if you have any cards on that, Mr. President, but if you don't, I'd request a continuance for two weeks. This is item number six? On that address, on item six, 8136 Gold Avenue. Okay. Uh, and, this, and the fire department has advised that that would not be a problem. Okay, no, that uh, is not an address that I have a speaker card from, so without objection, we'll continue that address uh, per Mr. Weiss's request. The balance of that item is held on the desk to hear from members of the public. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Items for which public hearings have been held, items 7 through 18. There are two reports on item number 18. A motion is required, and I understand that the uh, recommendation was to adopt the ITGS report. Okay, Mr. Parks moves on item 18. I'd like to call 18 special. Okay, 18 call special by Mr. Parks. Uh, colleagues, items 7 through now 17 remaining before us. Public hearing on these items has been held. A motion from the floor would be required to reopen the public hearings. Seeing no such motion, do we have any further requests for specials? Items 7 through 17, Mr. Smith? 17, 17 special. 17 call special by Mr. Smith. 7 call special by Mr. Garcetti. Request to continue item number 12 by Mr. Garcetti for one week. That would be July 22nd. Is there any objection to continuing item number 12? Seeing none, item 12 is continued. Colleagues, any other specials? Item 7 through 18 before us at this time. Seeing no further requests for specials, uh, Madam Clerk, on the balance of the items, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Those are approved. Next items, Mr. President, are items for which public hearings have not been held, items 19 through 41. <coughs> Colleagues, items 19 through 41 now before us. Item 40 has previously been continued. I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council on these items. Therefore, we shall deem the public hearing satisfied. Members wishing to call any specials? I think the clerk already noted that we're going to continue item 41 day, correct? Thank yes, that's already been done. Any specials on these items? Mr. Reyes. Item 35, please. 35, call special by Mr. Reyes. Any other specials? Mr. Number Smith. 21. 21, call special by Mr. Smith. Any other specials, colleagues? Items 19 through 41 before us. Seeing no further requests for specials, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Those items are approved. Next item, please. On the supplemental agenda, items 42 and 43 are items for which public hearings have been held. 
Colleagues 42 and 43 now before us, public hearings have been held on these items. Do we have any requests for specials? Ms. Hahn. Yes, I think you have a speaker card, but I'd like to call 42 special. Okay, 42 special. We do have a card. Public hearing has been held in committee. A motion from the floor would be required to reopen the public hearing. Mr. Parks calls item 43 special. Ms. Hahn has called item 42 special. Next item, please. Items for which public hearings have not been held, items 44 through 46. Um, item number 45 actually does has had a public hearing, and there are three uh, separate uh, reports and a substitute motion on that. A motion is required on okay, 45. Let's hold item 45 for Ms. Misikowski. She's in the back with our police commissioner. Items 44 and 46 still before us. I do not have a uh, 45 request. special. 45 calls special. We're holding it on the desk. Items 44 and 46. Public hearings have not been held, and I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council on these items. Therefore, we shall deem the public hearings open and closed. Mr. City Attorney. On item number 46, council is to act on the motion today. Adoption of the ordinance will be placed on the continuation agenda for tomorrow's meeting. Okay. Uh, with that announcement, members wishing to call either item 44 or 46 special. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Item 44 is approved. And Next item, please. And 46, the, uh, the report, excuse me, the motion is adopted and the order will be on the continuation page. Yes. Uh, yep. Going back to the items called special, item number three was called special inasmuch as there are cards from the public. Colleagues, item number three is now before us and the council calls forward Elaine Mathis. Ms. Mathis. Okay, what I tell you, my name is Let me speak. Yes. Yeah. Just tell me what to speak. Hello. Okay. Hello, how y'all doing? My name is Elaine Mathis, and I'm here to speak on the property at 4109 Zamora. Item three. Item three. We're just requesting a one week enlargement of time. You come on, tell me. Hi, uh, if I may, my name is Lou Hollingsworth, and uh, I'd like to speak on her behalf. She has been uh, uh, having some health problems and has been taking like uh, prescribed medication. Uh, we're just requesting uh, the Honorable Council to uh, grant Ms. Mathis a one week enlargement of time to rehear this matter so she can uh, meet with uh, the Department of Building and Safety and try to work through some issues. Professor, this is your time. This is your time to address the council when you're done, then we'll continue with the council discussion on this item. Okay, like I'm saying, uh, my name is Lou Hollingsworth and I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Mathis on uh, item three on the uh, council's agenda. I'd like to say, uh, first of all, uh, greetings to the Honorable Council of the City of Los Angeles. And Ms. Mathis, due to her health problems, she's been taking like prescribed medications. Uh, uh, we're just asking that the council would uh, grant her a one week enlargement of time so that she could meet with building and safety with myself to kind of work through some issues and okay. then come back and have a rehearing on this matter. Okay, thank you very much. You're quite welcome, sir. This concludes public comment on this item. The chair recognizes Ms. Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, met with uh, the individuals here uh, today and the building and safety representative is here as well and have explained to them that this is a REAP case and has gone on for some time, but I felt that it was important for the owner of the property to be able to put her position on the record today. Uh, it was, I, I was the individual who suggested that they have seven days uh, continuance uh, because they've already had an extensive amount of time to try to work through these problems so uh, if my colleagues will indulge me, uh, I will extend this for one week and then that would be uh, the last of the extensions so that they could reach a resolution and an understanding on how to resolve this problem with building and safety to building and safety's satisfaction as it does involve the removal of asbestos in a residential property. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Colleagues, we have a request for continuance on this item. Seeing no objection, item three is continued for one week. Next item, please. Item six was called special for cards from the public, and there is also an amending motion uh, presented by council member Zion that has been distributed to the council members. Okay. Uh, 
The council calls forward Charles Young, Philip Fong, Bulos Hilo, Hart Bachner. And we have other speaker cards also. As I call your names, please form a line behind the podium. If you would all come forward at this time. Charles Young. Yes, Council. Um, my name is Charles Young. I'm the owner of the property at uh, 2306 North Indiana Avenue, uh, 90032. I received the letter um, and report June 17th, 03, 18 months after the hearing. And the report in that letter correspondence is inaccurate, not accurate at all. So I'm against the adoption of I guess I'm against the adoption of item one, the findings of the commission. Uh, with regard to item two, I'm also against the confirmation of the assessments based on the er erroneous report that was part of the correspondence of 17 June 03. I also have a package here of uh, like to submit to the council for review with more data on the hearing and some of the information I feel is lacking from the uh, complete report provided by the fire department at the Brush Clearance uh, Center in Van Nuys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Who's Mr. here LaVange? for the departments? The individual okay, uh, assessments. Sure that we, should, we should have the, up uh, front. the sergeant get that. Thank you. And the city attorney and the fire department are both yes. here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lavange. For the members of the public waiting to be heard, uh, let me read through everybody's name first. This is a public hearing uh, on this item. Uh, everybody will get a chance to be heard, but let me also uh, ask you to be cognizant of the clock and the fact that there are uh, 10 speakers waiting to be heard. So we'd ask that you keep your comments brief uh, and to the point and to not be too repetitive of speakers who have come before you. Our next speaker will be Philip Fong, followed by Bulos Hilo, uh, I believe it's Hart Bachner, and Ricardo Rebolo. Please come forward. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Phil Fong. I'm the property owner of uh, 4746 Collis Avenue in South Pasadena. I was assessed a fee of uh, 1452 for the 2000 Bush clearance. I would like to take this opportunity to oppose the decision by the hearing examiner or package number, number 2185 009. I have additional information regarding the prop that that property I that I believe was not heard when the final proposed decision was finalized by the hearing examiner. I'm disputing the proposed decision on basis that it was not my property that was cleared by the city contractor. In the in the decisions it states that I I have said my property extend beyond the hill. My property does need extend that far, and I want to show you through my exhibit A and B how far my property extend. I I want that take into I want that take into consideration before this proposal is finalized. Before a final decision is entered in my record. I want the county to prove or at least take into consideration that my property was not cleared by the city contractor. I also want to, would like the case to be postponed until new evidence is heard. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, Bulos Hilo. Hi, my name is uh, Bulos Hilo. I used to own a property in Chatsworth, and during the time we own it, we have a company always cleaning the weed wherever it's dangerous for fire hazards. And last year we sold it in 202, 
And uh, this year we received a letter, uh, so the land needs to be clear. So we went to the city and we notify him we're not the owner anymore. And we gave him the name of the new owner. And, uh, and instead of sending him a letter, they sent me a letter that they're requesting for cleaning it, which is they failed to notify the new owner, which is I, this property doesn't belong to us anymore. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hart Bachner. And our following speakers will be Ricardo Reboyo, Paula Knuckles Harris, and Peter Grassel. Peter, Gra Peter Grassel is my representation, so he's going to start. Uh, morning, council members. Uh, Peter Grassel representing Hart Bachner. Uh, just want to review the facts in this very quickly. Um, this is regarding an assessment on 1746 Korea Way, Mr. Hart, Mr. Bachner's uh, residence. Um, on May 19, 2000, a non-compliance order was issued. Uh, Mr. Bachner cleared uh, the brush on July 11th of that year, July 11th, 2000, and called for a reinspection shortly thereafter on July 26, 2000. Um, on October 25th, Mr. Bachner uh, woke up to some uh, noise created by some brush clearing in the vicinity of his property. It was not on his property. He went to uh, go talk to the workmen, and they said, you know, they were uh, clearing brush um, uh, supposedly on his property, and Mr. Bachner at that point said, this is not my property, I've already cleared the brush, um, you know, and, and they can they, they actually said they weren't here to clear my property, but the adjacent property. And uh, so they continued to do that. Um, subsequent to that, on November 20th, there was a hearing on this matter in which Mr. Bachner um, laid out uh, the facts that was it was not year. his, um, November 20th, 2000, no, Mr. Because. of 2001, I'm sorry. Mr. Bachner laid out the facts that this was not his property that was being cleared. Um, uh, several, a week after that, um, inspectors uh, Bernal and Foz came out to his property to, to look at the work that was done. Um, and here we are, you know, a year, two years later, dealing with the same issue. Uh, Mr. Bachner has photographs that clearly show that the work was not done on his property. Um, so we respectfully request that the council takes that into consideration and okay. denies this um, assessment. When Thank the you. worker, when the inspectors did come out to the property after the the hearing, they brought a plot map with them, which clearly showed that the property that was cleared and the photographs that they brought with them was not <clears throat> on my side of the plot map. And they okay. sort of looked at each other, shrugged, and then the issue disappeared until about a month ago, a year and a half later. So okay. I'm, I'm troubled by this. I have photographs of the property which thoroughly articulate uh, the, the property line and the area that was cleared. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll have the sergeants take those pictures if you wish to add those to the record. Thank Our you. next speaker is Ricardo Reboyo. And he'll be followed by Paula Knuckles Harris, Brad Houston, and Hing Ho. These will be our final four speakers on this item. Good morning. Uh, I just want to bring copies of the cancel check on the Rio property and the letter that I was there on the year 2000 with, in, with Inspector Tissinger. Uh, I don't know what I mean blue on the computer. The day I was there, he clarified that uh, when it's in blue, he's done. And I have my pictures that I, we clean the empty lot that we have in the Rio. That's all. I have the cancel check from the uh, gardener, that how much we pay. But now we have a bill from uh, fire department for 932 charging us on September when we made the job on June. So uh, probably in two months, I don't think it grows so much. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Knuckles? Um, hello. 
city council. Um, the reason I'm here about the brush clearance is I did send in um, proof of the reasons why the, um, the brush was cleared to the specifications in spring of 1999 and also again in spring of 2000. The specifications that I had at that time, which was the minimum requirements, I did not know that due to high brush danger that year, they wished that the whole hillside be cleared because this is not even a home, there's just a hillside. And even the letter that I did receive from the fire department in regards to this issue is still addressed to my mother. And my main problem is that I have sent the county assessor's office changes of address and change of property ownership, and it has never been taken care of in the office to where I never received the letters for the brush clearance. I had my husband, Ron, do the brush clearance, and then I found out a long time later from the fire department that it wasn't done to code and that it had been cleared. So I just would like for some of the monies to be returned because this weed abatement shouldn't have been done because it's not my fault that the assessor's office never changed the names or the addresses, although I did send in the information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brad Houston. Hi, I'm here because uh, I went to a hearing on this issue and the uh, proposed decision was mailed to me. It wasn't, wasn't authored, I assumed it was by the hearing examiner uh, or the fire department, I'm not sure which. But the, uh, this, under here it, has, it says substance of report and he's not been accurate in uh, describing what occurred at the hearing. Uh, the, main, the main thing is the, the amount of money was $2,700. And I clear this property every year for 22 years. It's never taken me more than uh, eight hours. I cleared it this year, it took me four hours. $2,700 for four hours work was a little excessive. Uh, you have it broke down to $1,700 from the contractor. Well, I brought up at the hearing earlier, uh, I asked the fire department about the bids, and after a while he admitted there was only uh, one bid for this work. So the bidder could have chose any price he wanted. $1,700 is what he chose. And again, I spent four hours this year doing the same work. Uh, now I have two properties side by side divided by uh, uh, a subdivision line, but they're on one deed. And they're charging me, you know, the administration fees, which are $318 times two. And uh, it's really on one deed. And sometimes I get the uh, correspondence in one envelope, so I, I know they're aware that it's on one deed. And uh, the I'm other issue. If I may ask you to conclude, please. Pardon me? If I may ask you to conclude. Yeah, the other last issue was the situation with the, they implemented a fine that year. It was the first year they implemented that fine. And every year in the past, they always issued a uh, noncompliance if the brush wasn't cleared properly by mail. And the, this particular year, they did not. They, they issued it uh, as a posted sign. and. Uh, I don't live at the property, so I don't vi didn't visit the property after the sign. So these are the three things: the uh, fine, which uh, you know is, is implemented in almost in a deceiving way. I, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but there's no way for me to know about the posted sign and the uh, assessment times two or, or the uh, administration fee times two and the value of the cleared property was four hours, four hours work one by one person. That's, thank, that's all. Thank you very much. Our final speaker will be Hing Ho. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Hing Ho, and this is concerning a failure of uh, fire inspection at the property of 18,600 18, Primer Street, Northridge. Um, I have a hearing in the November 13, 2001, and I just, oh, I didn't want to get too much echo. 
And um, I got this letter back from the, about the hearing. And in there, the first paragraph is the substance of protest. And it's, it says something that didn't even include the main point that I was uh, trying to argue about why I should be uh, reassessed the penalty of uh, $932. Uh, the failed infection is in year 2000. And uh, I, I have owned that property for a long time and we use the same gardener at least uh, 15 years. And I have many, many inspections every year. In 1999, and I passed the inspection. And then in 19, 2000, and, and in year 2000, uh, they, they told me I failed the inspection, and I don't understand why. Okay. Uh, and also just happened, and I did not receive a letter from fire department that notified me the failure of the inspection okay. in that year. Now, I, I'm not sure what happened uh, because I, I live in Agora. I'm not living in that property. That's a rental property. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we did receive just one more card, Jerry Berger. If I can ask you to come quickly, and we'd appreciate your brevity. My name is uh, Jerry Berger. I'm a resident at 7927 Oceanus Drive in Los Angeles. Uh, I appeared at a hearing in, uh, on this matter in, in the year 2000, 2001. The uh, letter, the, the report that was given here has many factual errors in it. One is that it, 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 it says that I was not at present at a hearing and, uh, and Captain Milhauser, who was here today, uh, showed me a corrected <coughs> uh, notice with a handwritten uh, statement correcting that error. My objection is that at the hearing, I, I informed the hearing officer that, and the two fire commission personnel <coughs> that we had relied in, on in cleaning our property for that year on what an inspector had, had, had instructed us the prior year, in 1999, which year was approved. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, we were advised that we needed to clear in that year an additional 20 feet of our hillside. The fire personnel who were at the uh, hearing that I, appeared, that I was at stated that in some cases the inspectors uh, did not inform the residents in the year 1999 that the regulations had changed, and they allowed uh, and, and failed to inform them that, that they had changed by increasing the, the footage to 200 feet from the resident. I relied on, on my prior year's experience and then uh, got uh, and had the property cleared to that point. When the inspector came out, at the time that the crew had appeared unexpectedly, he said, why didn't they clear the last 10 feet? And it was only 10 feet of brush additional that needed to be cleared. For that, I was assessed like $1,500, uh, which was probably about 15 minutes worth of work. If I can ask you to conclude, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes public comment on appeals against the confirmation of assessments for the proposed year 2000 brush clearance. Turning now to council discussion, the chair of the Public Safety Committee, Ms. Misikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to have the department come to the table, but I would also like to, to ask all of the people who testified to wait and listen, and uh, hopefully you can talk to the department afterwards. Uh, members, what this is is a confirmation uh, from the year 2000 brush clearance on parcels. Quick uh, uh, summary, we send out probably 30 to 40,000 notices every spring to homeowners uh, and owners of property in our hillside areas. We all know the devastation that it can occur uh, because of brush. And for many, many years, the city has had this program in place, and we send out these uh, significant numbers of notices. And the majority of people understand it. 
seriously take a, make attention to, to get it done and deal with it. There are a number in the city who don't, and we now have got some regularized parcels where the city just steps up and clears them right away. What we are seeing today is that um, of, the, of the majority of parcels, we probably had 200 and some uh, initial protests of this assessment from, 19, from the year 2000. Uh, the hearings are held by the fire department. Uh, hearing examiners, and we heard some of that testimony today. Some said that when I talked to the hearing examiner, I tried to explain this, and obviously as we've now distilled it down to have about, I think, maybe 10 parcels that I heard from people who spoke today, um, I'm, I'm going to move a couple of things. One, that we pull out of this assessment, and this assessment is $1.9 million that the city forces expended to do the work on these parcels where um, it had not been done, or at least the department perceived it had not been done. Um, but I'm going to ask that we, so we pull those 10 parcels out, which are very small a part of the um, maybe 290 parcels that are being assessed today, that we confirm the assessment uh, as presented with those being removed, refer those that are being removed back to the department and the commission. And for those of you who are here, um, those who gave the material to the sergeant at arms, we're going to make sure that the department gets it. Um, those who didn't give your material directly, I'm going to ask the department to uh, meet in the back of the room or the um, uh, outside the door there so you can give that information. They can get your specific name and specific parcels so that we can look at it. Members, um, there were a lot of issues. Some said, I don't own the parcel that was cleared, and I tried to clear that up, but it wasn't cleared up. Some have said, I agreed the parcel wasn't cleared, but I think the city charged too much, and the penalty shouldn't be paid. So there are a variety of issues here, but the good news is that we had, in the year 2000, some 30 to 40,000 parcels. The vast majority were cleared, and the city went in and did the, the rest. Uh, just letting you know, tomorrow we have this same issue for those parcels for the year 2001, where we'll be confirming the assessments. We have also changed the process because in the past we've had um, a lot of our homeowners and concerns in the community that those who weren't taking the, the notice upon themselves and clearing the properties quickly, that the process was too delayed and that by the time the city got around to clearing those parcels um, that were necessary, uh, it, we, we were right in the heart of the brush season, which is the worst time to leave some of those parcels, particularly those that are a little more remote and maybe not tended to as the way they should be. Uh, we, we should be clearing them quickly. We can resolve the issue as, of assessment. We can resolve this through hearing. And I think the department is here and agrees with this recommendation, which is to remove those parcels <coughs> for which there were protests today, referring them back to the department and the commission for uh, further determination, but go ahead and confirm the assessment on the uh, vast majority of other parcels where the work was done and there was no protest, and this is being accepted. Uh, Chief, did you have anything you wanted to add, or Captain Mill? House. Uh, Chief Storms, uh, Industrial Commercial, I'm in charge and oversee the brush clearance unit. Yeah. This is uh, Captain Milhauser, he's in charge of the uh, Valley Fire Prevention uh, Brush Clearance Unit out in Van Nuys. Um, this, I concur with the uh, uh, Councilwoman Mizikowski's uh, recommendation to take another look, even though all the people that uh, appealed, the 191 that appealed, all did a, get a city attorney hearing. They all did get a uh, opportunity to take this to the fire commission and now they've brought it to the city council. So they've actually had three opportunities to debate and discuss the concerned issues. And to think that we've come down to a total of only about less than 10 problems or still out, outstanding discussions I think speaks very highly for the uh, for Captain Milhauser's unit. They processed 128,000 parcels that, that year and uh, we had only 191 protests of the work that was done, which is far less than 1%, giving them about a 99% compliance rate through the normal process. And uh, if you'd like, we can meet uh, across the street at Fire Department Headquarters with the folks that have come today, get their information. If you can give us about a week, we can come back and give you our final recommendation. Although this is the hearing officer's decision, we can still look and see if there's something that has happened that we missed. I, I think there, it's worthwhile to let these people have a further right of appeal. So again, each one of the member, the people who are here has protested, uh, meet with the department uh, to the side, make sure they have your number. If you can stay a little bit later, they'll take it over and work with you individually uh, across the street at the fire 
department's offices. But we should move forward on the rest. And as I said, uh, we'll, we'll let the, uh, an additional hearing, an additional discussion go on with the ones who uh, raised the protest today, but move forward with the confirmation as presented by the department with the exception of those parcels. Okay. Thank you. And we do have other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Labange. Mr. Zine, followed by Mr. Cardenas. Yes, I have a question on, this is from 2000. How many yes, of the 2000 have repeated in 2001 not complied with the inspection? Not complied with the clearance, I should say. Um, well, let me address that. My name is Bob Milhauser, captain in charge of the brush unit, um, President Padilla and council members. Uh, the question was how many repeated from 2000 in, uh, into the t year 2001. We had approximately 390 properties that have repeated the same violations. And then again into the year um, 2002, we, we had a total of 72 properties that fell into that same category. And the department has um, put into process a, a expedited procedure to handle those property owners. So we have certain property owners, while we have great compliance with some, we have certain property owners that continue to violate and not comply. Yes, on a repeated, on a repeated basis, yes, sir. And, and some of those are included in the uh, ones that we're hearing today. They are, they are included in the report. I, there's none of them that came present here today, right. to the best of my knowledge. And the new process just went into effect this current year and was uh, implemented May 1st. 72 property owners were inspected on an expedited process. Okay, so the number is coming down, but there's still that resistance from some right. property owners not to comply. And I totally support this program. It's a critical program, and especially when we find the season as warm and, as it and is now. The compliance over the years is improving year after year. And I mean, when you have a, a program that is 99% successful uh, at minimum, it, we're very pleased with the uh, with the process and the cooperation from the citizens. And it's just those uh, ones that don't want to get the message where we have to uh, take more aggressive action. And, and, you know, to be fair, there is uh, absentee owners and, and, you know, health issues that do arise, and, and there's not a pattern there, so. And I passed a, uh, an amendment to uh, amend item number six on a particular parcel which we were uh, recommended by the city attorney to grant a continuance on that. And I understand that the fire department's also uh, agreeing with that continuance on a particular parcel. Uh, Are you aware of that? Uh, I'm not aware the direction of, that. of city council. Is that with uh, Mr. Catiline? Is that the property owner? Um, I don't remember the name. It is. Uh, I don't have the name of the. Uh, I have the address 4995. Lionel Drive, Woodland Hills. If that's your direction, sure, we'll definitely look well, at there, that. Well, there's some recommendation because of the city attorney's uh, question on this, some legality, and they asked that. In fact, we have the city attorney representative here that we asked that that one be continued until uh, August 15th. It, Gail? Yes, Gail Weingart, assistant city attorney. It was my understanding from um, a discussion with your office that the person who was protesting was out of the country until August 15th, and uh, I don't think the fire department or the city attorney's office has a problem with continuing that one parcel. So I would ask that uh, we continue that one, uh, and I support uh, Councilmember Sikowski on what she's wishing to do with these other protesters uh, or other individuals who are protesting that. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zine. Uh, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank uh, the people who came forward in protest because it is our responsibility to listen to you and to do the job that we have as a city. So I want to thank you first and foremost for exercising your, your right and your responsibility to do that. Um, but I have a question to the department. I found it kind of curious that I heard someone say that to clear their parcel, which seemed like the bid was kind of high, a $1,700 bid with only one company apparently bid on it. Uh, are, we, are you comfortable with the progress that you've had with a number of companies that, that do bid on these projects? Is that an anomaly to have only one person bid on such a size of a project? It, it can be determined by a couple of factors. Uh, what, where it occurs, the bid, where it occurs during the year, whether or not the other contractors are committed on other projects, because it's a rotating bid process that allows them time to bid and complete the work. It's kind of an ongoing through the season. 
Uh, you may have it in a certain area of town where the crew is already working in that part of town, so therefore uh, they want to bid on that particular parcel versus or your crews are all across the other side of the city. It is kind of unusual for only one person to bid on the property, um, but there are situations that can lead to that happening. Is, is there a process to where you go back out to bid if you feel as though one bid wasn't enough? Yes. May I address that? Um, first off, right now we have 13 contractors that are currently bid and go through the process. Our inspectors, when they inspect the property and take photographs, they estimate what the bid should be at. If the bids come in from a contractor 20% greater than our estimate, we will pull it, we will not put it out to bid and we'll let it go back out the next week so that the contractors can get their bids within line. We do that to protect our constituents. Uh, additionally, for you to have just one contractor bid on a property, it's extremely rare and I'm, I'd have to research it. I don't have that information with me to confirm or to deny that. You mentioned there are 13 contractors who are in the pool to bid on these uh, projects. Is that a cap or it just happens to be 13? The, How does that work? The last time that the city went out to the uh, RFP process request for proposal, we uh, had several contractors submit the required information to um, prove to the city that they were, a, you know, a legitimate Bonded, contractor. Yeah. And uh, 13 met those requirements. Um, since then, that's what we've been using. The next RFP process will be uh, in the year 2005. 2005. Yeah. Also, if, uh, what I'd like to get uh, for my purposes, I used to do this with my father for many, many, many years in the San Fernando Valley. So I know a little bit about the hard work that it takes and, and what it is. I'd like to know a little bit more about this bid process. I'd like to know a little bit more about who we try to attract or who we are attracting to try to be in this contractor's pool. Because uh, 13 uh, sounds like an okay number, but potentially in a, a heavy brush year, we might have a lot of contracts that we need to get bid on, and maybe those folks are getting a little over their head with the number. And like you mentioned, it's a big city. You know, if they're in the neighborhood, they love to bid down the street or around the corner right. or what have you, makes it better for the contractor. But jumping around the city, maybe some of them chose not to bid on it because uh, a lot of factors that contributed to that. But as a result, we have a constituent here who feels as though $1,700 was way over the top. And uh, you know, maybe it would have been should have been something a little bit more fair. If you would like, we can uh, have members of our staff meet with your your staff and uh, review the process for because uh, we're we've got more contractors and more contractors, but still, it is very difficult to get uh, qualified contractors that can that can work for us. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, I did this with my father. He was licensed with the city as a gardener, and uh, he did that kind of work. But at the same time. He was never educated to the fact that he could even be involved in this process back then. Uh, and that would be on me to make sure that I uh, work on the constituents because I have a lot of gardeners in my district mm -hmm. like my father was. So for me to educate them as a councilman, to, and I think it's better for them, it's better for the city, and it's better for the constituents that we have more p people competing uh, so that we actually have, uh, you know, as, you know, as honest a bid and, a, and as a truthful a process as we can have all the way around. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. Any other m members wishing to be heard on this? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, what do we have before us? Uh, there are two amending motions. There's Mr. Zine's uh, amending motion and Council Member uh, Ms. Sikowski's motion to uh, uh, confirm uh, the assessments uh, with, uh, except for the 10 uh, parcels that uh, were uh, protested against today and those will be referred back to the fire department. Okay, colleagues, <clears throat> with those changes, we have this item before us. Can I, uh, Mr. May I just yes. add one more attorney. thing? I think, yes, I think that we would be, the fire department uh, would be prepared to bring those back next week if you would want to continue those and put them on the agenda for possibly next Wednesday when we're going to be here on the other items. Okay, if there's no objection, why don't we uh, do that? We'll bring those back next Wednesday. Um, Mr. LeBond's moves, Mr. Parks seconds that. Um, all right, colleagues, we have the package before us. If, Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll? Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That item is approved. Next item. Item number seven, call special by Council Member Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I wonder if there's staff here just to report on 
wanted to check on the prop F and Q buildings and see how we're doing with the green building standards that we uh, asked be applied. I know I've mostly been hearing good news but wanted to get an update for the rest of the council. Colleagues, we, we became the largest city in this uh, country uh, last year when we adopted LEED standards for our public buildings and the first ones in which we're going to be doing LEED is a uh, uh, standard for environmental sustainable building um, in the country and uh, we've um, all agreed to apply this here and want to just hear from staff um, how our progress is on that front. If you hold the balance of my time, Mr. President. We've incorporated the um, sustain, sustain, sustainable design standards into our construction um, um, well standards and for all of our uh, all of our bond programs, whether it's F or Q, um, and as we get into even the library and the, the zoo bond program. So we understand that it is a policy um, adopted by this council and the mayor. As a consequence, it is part of our, our core value systems for our construction programs. Is there any more detail about any of the specific projects? And I know we, we just had the library open in Mr. Padilla's uh, district that was the highest standard we've had yet. Are we looking at any silver, possibly gold standard buildings uh, or just basic lead standard? Is that what we're aiming for right now? Yvette Sanchez owns LAPD. We're just now in the uh, design process for the Prop Q projects. Um, all of the architects have been instructed to comply with the, the minimum lead standards, but preferably to exceed them. Um, we will come back to you as we get into awarding contracts uh, for construction, and all of our projects are required to meet minimum lead standards. Is, is, the, is there any weighting given to that in, in the bidding uh, system by how, how high that lead standard is exceeded at all? Not that I'm aware of. Were you aware of anything in the bid, in the RFPs for uh, exceeding? Is that one of the categories? I don't, in the I don't RFPs? believe there is. Okay. Uh, we have RFPs that are still going out all the time, I imagine. Um, we have concluded all the RFPs for all the Prop Q projects. Yeah, okay. Can we, can we um, maybe it's for the CEO, as we look at future RFPs that go out, can we uh, consider uh, whether or not um, we would uh, give points or weight higher levels of the standards, uh, the lead standards, exceeding the lead standards in assessing the RFP in, in future? Maybe if you can just uh, let us know if, offline or, or report back if that's going to be something possible we in future RFPs since they've already been concluded. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank that's you. All, Mr. President. Other members wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 17, call special by Council Member Smith. Mr. Smith. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. President, I think I've resolved the issues I had on that one and uh, moved to approval. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Other members wishing to be heard on item 17? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Item number 18, call special by Council Member Parks, and there are two reports on the file. Item 18 is now before us. We do need a motion. Uh, since we have multiple committee reports on this item, Chair recognizes Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to ask the city staff to come up. Uh, what we have here, and I think it's very important uh, to have a briefing, as the city has gone forward on putting together a one-stop uh, internet program to advise uh, contractors, uh, people that bid on contracts, and uh, a variety of other services from the City of LA that now can access that throughout the uh, entire uh, uh, area. And I like to, I think it's important because we hear this throughout the community about uh, contractors finding out how they get in the process for procurement bids and contracts, and now the city's gone forward, and uh, I'll deal with the other issue of the uh, receive and file after your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Blackwell. Good morning, council members. I'm director of the Los Angeles MBOC and the assistant deputy mayor of economic development. Hi, Cliff Eng with the, I'm assistant general manager with the information technology agency. 
We're very pleased to make a very brief presentation on the status of the Business Assistance Virtual Network, which is known as the Bavin. The program was begun several years ago as a means of allowing businesses to use an online system to access the city's contracting opportunities. This was very necessary because prior to that, each city agency was designing and marketing their own contract opportunities and businesses were at a loss as to how to track and effectively participate in the process. And if this was a problem for major companies, you know that it was an insurmountable program, uh, problem for minority women and other local small businesses that had skills, services, and products that they wished to sell to the city of Los Angeles. The Bobbin is now up and running and can be accessed via uh, the internet by going to our website, which is labavn.org. Uh, just in summary for you quickly, the total number of opportunities posted to date has been over 580. Uh, each month now we have more than 100 opportunities being added to that list. Uh, we had more than 27,000 visitors to the website last year. Um, we have more than uh, 3,000, 4,000 actually vendors who have registered to be part of this process, and we have 152 city agencies that are using this. So the question is, where will we be going in the future? And what we are proposing to do is to, number one, more effectively uh, promote this. We want businesses across the city to be able to know how to do this, how to register. And it's very important because once a business registers for this Bobbin program, they identify the area that they're interested in, the skills and services that they're interested in providing, and what kind of contracting opportunities they're interested in. Then what happens is they are then emailed or faxed, but at this point emailed, contracting opportunities so that they know what contracts are open that really fit their skill set so that they can bid. And I think that this is very important for smaller businesses that don't have the staff to do additional marketing on their own time. This allows businesses to more effectively utilize their resources to be part of the process. Now in the LA MBOC office, and we serve this uh, function for city agencies and public works, we receive 50 to 60 contacts and calls from primes every uh, week looking for MBEs, WBEs, DBEs, and others to bid on projects. This will also provide a more effective means of our staff being able to um, quickly address those concerns. Uh, once a prime is registered, as we said, they can also, for any contract that the city has, they can uh, view a list of subs that have been identified as being suitable for that. So there's some things that we think we'll be able to do that'll be more effective. We'll be able to help businesses meet the good faith effort. We want to work with Public Works to be able to make the certification process more online accessible so that businesses can, can track and can facilitate their uh, certification process. This is important because right now Public Works has a backlog of over 300 companies that are seeking certification that want to bid on projects. We want to help Public Works be able to more quickly be able to take care of those businesses so that they can be in the mix and they can bid on projects. We also want to use this process to help businesses access the business licensing process that the City of Los Angeles has because that's a requirement for doing business. Also to be able to look at where their uh, tax status is. Are they current? Where are they? What do they need to do? These are resources that we know the Bobbin will be more effectively able to deliver. We think that it's a very, very important process. We think that it will really strengthen the economic climate in Los Angeles, and we're very pleased to be able to provide this service. Colleagues, I think uh, this is a, one of those projects that for years we've hoped that would come to al uh, alive and now it's here. And I think it's important that we all uh, advise all those contractors and interested parties in our community uh, that this uh, now is on the web and that they have easy access easy. to bids, grants, and, and uh, procurements. And I uh, move that we uh, approve the ITGS report uh, as, uh, and note the uh, economic development, we note and file the economic development report and that the mayor's office ITGA, ITA will come back to the ITGS com committee in the near future to talk about funding for the uh, upcoming year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Parks. You. Other members wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll.
Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 21, call special by Council Member Smith. Mr. Smith. Yes, may I have Mr. Fujioka at the table, please? Mr. CEO, I have a couple of questions dealing with this MOU agreement on DWP, uh, uh, IBEW. It's my understanding that you're bringing some people into a class that previously were not in the class when the MOU was written. Is that correct? Well, what, it, what it does do is it adds a couple of classes to receive um, a longevity bonus. It also identifies three specific individuals to get a hazardous um, uh, materials bonus at the LA fil filtration plant. How many people are in these additional classes? I'll have to have the department help me with that. Okay. Four people or four classes? <laughs> there were four classes. The department had, oh, it affects, I'm sorry. It affects 28 incumbents in those classes. 20 people all that. And yes. is this raising any of their benefits at all, or is this just moving them into an MOU from a different? It would raise their salary um, because it gives them what, we, what we've characterized as a longevity bonus. For the three individuals who received the um, hazardous materials bonus, it would also raise your salary to reflect the, um, you know, the special duties associated with that assignment. And how much percentage-wise? The um, for the uh, longevity bonus is 2.5 percent at five and ten years um, of service. For the hazardous materials bonus, I believe it's like about five and a half. Five and a half percent. Five and a half. Over the longevity of the MOU or just the first year? It's a continuous bonus they would have received from, from this point until. Yeah, well, it probably be, we'd, we'd put those bonuses in place for those assignments, so it would just continue. Okay, are, and are there equivalent positions within the city structure, not DWP, that, that you could say these are the same jobs? There's some similarities. Okay, and did those people receive that kind of benefit in their MOU? No. They did not. Okay, members of the council, this is a problem I've seen many times before, and for the new members in particular, we continue to allow water and power to increase above and beyond what the regular city employees are getting in their MOUs. And this council many years ago instructed the DWP not to continue to negotiate MOUs that raise their level above and beyond what other city employees are getting. And they continually raid our employment base here in the general services and other departments because they're paying more over there. And this council said we don't want to do that anymore. So my question is why are we giving another group of people additional raises above and beyond what other city employees are getting at the same classifications? That's my question to you. Why are we doing this? When the council said we don't want to do that anymore. Well, without, I'll try to speak for the department, but the department felt that in, in their best interest to reflect some of the special duties and responsibilities assigned to the um, employees who encumber those classes, that the, um, what's been proposed in the MOU is something that they felt was necessary. We've had a very long discussion with the department on these issues. I know it's a concern. Ne necessary for what reason? To fill the positions. Just to fill the positions? Principally to fill a position, but also to reflect the, um, the unique nature of their duties and responsibilities. I understand on the hazardous side of it, but I don't understand why we continue to give those higher salaries than other city employees are getting when the council said, and Ms. Miskowski, you were here when we did that, we said we don't want to do that anymore. Why do we continue to give these kind of deals to water and power that we do not give to our city employees when the council said stop it? No, well, the prince. One of the principal reasons behind any type of longevity bonus is for retention purposes. And the department felt that um, this type of bonus was necessary to ensure not only the, their, their ability to recruit and fill these positions, but also retain them in a well, very competitive market. We could use that argument on two-thirds of the jobs in this city. Certainly, clerk typists, we could, we could use that argument over and over again. I mean, we have a lot of positions we have a hard time filling. Understand. So we wanted to do that to all of them. I don't think we don't want to open that door, do we? Do you, CAO, want to open that door to all those classifications of the city that we have problems keeping filled? 
Not necessarily. Okay, and so we're having a power problem over here where we have hard hiring freezes now, and we're, we're losing uh, electricians to DWP because they give better benefits, and it's our own DWP, our own department. Is that what's happening or continuing to happen? We are seeing some migration from our console control departments to DW, DWP. At, at a time we have a hard hiring freeze, we can't replace them. That's true. Okay, members of the council, I just... These are the kind of foolhardy policies that get us in trouble sometimes around here when we don't look at the extent to which they go throughout the city system. And I think this is one of those cases we really need to either say go back and talk about this again or just say no because we're losing people over here that we cannot fill because of hard hiring fleas, freeze and we're violating a policy this council passed years ago saying we wanted to bring the lid down and bring equity back between our own divisions of the city. Uh, I just say this is a bad idea, council members. Ms. Misikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're absolutely right, and I do recall it, but with every rule, there are exceptions. This, don't blame the CAO for this. This came through the Employee Relations Committee, on which sit the Chair of Budget and Finance, the Chair of Personnel, the Chair of uh, the President Pro Tem back, um, and the Mayor. And there's five members, and we look at this. And in fact, at those meetings, and they're open to all council members uh, when they meet generally Tuesday afternoons, although this one is, is canceled, um, those discussions come up. And I remember specifically with this one, we said, well, what about the inequity and the policy? Um, but there was a persuasive reason to make an exception. This is not a big contract creating an inequity on a large parity scale. So the policy is still moving forward, but we felt there were persuasive reasons on these few positions. Uh, one, the hazardous situation, one helicopter. And you're right, we do give bonuses. And in fact, we have. I can remember a few years ago, uh, our, our PSAs, the, um, the, the PSRs, the public service representatives, those who answer 911, we gave them a bonus for retention. And that's, that is not a high paid class, although it probably should be. So you're right, the policy's there, but having said that, this was the recommendation on this contract to go forward uh, unanimously from EERC, and I believe that we should adopt it, being mindful of the policy and being mindful that this is not creating a, a gaping hole uh, and something that we do ask at every time we look at those salary levels, because particularly in, in those issues where we knew DWP was just this drain siphoning off uh, our public employees, we didn't want that to occur. And I think in this instance, you're right on the large scale that we're not going to try to, uh, we're going to try to create that parity. But on these few positions, I thought it was appropriate. And so I just wanted to explain that, that the policy is still in place and an absolutely right to ask at every time that we're not really creating a large balloon class that's just going to create that funnel. That, that is not good public policy. Mr. Zayn. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and colleagues. This has been a long tradition where uh, the city family has been split on this, where water and power has been way above for at least 35 years that I know of. And this situation hasn't improved over the years. It's probably gotten worse. Mr. Fujoka, do you have a solution to the problem? Yes. <laughs> it's not your fault. It's Mr. Smith's well, fault. It's <laughs> you brought it up, Mr. Smith. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, as time goes on, we find the situation continuing. And while the employees want to benefit for themselves and their families, and I can understand that, the compensation benefit package has always been lopsided. Yes. And how do we bring this in line, especially during these hard economic times? Well, I can probably speak on both sides of this equation. With respect to the salaries we offer um, employees represented by IBEW, we're in a very, very competitive market with some of the other public and private utilities that, that offer um, electrical and water service here in the state of California. It's important that we, we maintain a very competitive salary structure to, re, to retain, recruit and retain some key classifications that allow us to provide both power and water services here in, 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 in Los Angeles at a, at a rate that's cheaper than other rates up and down the state. Rates uh, for the consumers. Uh, rates for the consumers. But a clerk uh, typist but or I understand. management aid in the water and power will make more than in the police department and or wrecks that, and parks. But that's one of the consequences of maintaining that competition. But if the competition at one level 
why would it uh, why would it apply to clerical? I mean, the clerical supply is there, the clerical workforce is there. Why would a clerk typist at Water and Power bet, get better benefits and salary than someone at the police department or like, the fire department? Well, like any in any organization that has a very complex classification structure, well, what you do in, in a series of classes will impact. The, the whole department. You have to have a competitive, you have to have a consistent classification and compensation structure. So as you raise the salaries or impact the salaries for one class of employees, that tends to bleed over to your other classes. Now bringing our council control departments to parity with DWP is something that will um, have a significant impact on the city's general fund. No, and yet that, there is a consequence. There's a consequence because we have craftspeople at DWP that um, are in the same classifications as those found in our console control departments, and yet they are paid more. You can say that for most of the classifications, um, the technical classifications, administrative, um, those who work on our power lines. But again, it's a cost we pay to have a, a and to maintain a public utility here in um, California. But the problem for these departments is the constant flow. I saw a chart recently where some of the jobs of Water and Power compared to the council control departments, the salary were thousands of dollars ahead at Water and Power, not just hundreds, but thousands of dollars annually. That. And significant, uh, where an individual would say, I want to see if I can get into that department to benefit from that. And Mr. Smith has a valid point. This has been going on for many, many years. I know it's not your fault, but at what point do we finally say we need to do some check and bring the balance? I can understand the linemen. It's like an officer on the SWAT team. There's more hazard, more danger. But the clerk typist and the other administrative positions, I really don't see the logic behind that because the personnel of these other departments are constantly flown over to water and power. We're constantly having shortages in these other departments. The police department has over 500 civilian vacancies right now and they're going to make more at water and power and probably easier surroundings where they don't have to work 24 hours than at the police department, where it's a critical need for public safety. I understand. But can we fix it? Fixing it would, would take um, bringing our classes to parity, our constant control classes to um, salary parity with DWP would cost millions of dollars. Holding the line on the salary compensation for um, DWP classes would take private equal effort, maybe not on, in terms of dollars, but in terms of a, a political effort. But we try, the city tried to do this several years back and was faced with a very aggressive work action that would have a severe impact on everyone here in the city, our, our constituents, our businesses, um, everyone. And so what you're asking for is something that has both sides have very, very serious consequences. And instead of answering here at the table, we probably should come back through your EERC and have a, um, probably a detailed discussion on this. Because there's no easy answer well, to I, this. Well, as the budgets get tighter and the demand gets greater, I mean, I do respect the water and power folks, and especially in these days of 112 temperatures, to keep the homes cool and the Absolutely. water flowing. But there's also that urgency on the other part of the departments that are constantly coming to me in the personnel committee. We need people because, you know, we hire them and they keep leaving, they go into water and power. And this has been a continuing merry-go-round. Thank you. So we'll get something in the ERC, we can debate it and we'll come, come up with some, talk about hopefully some solution. Thank you. Mr. Labonge. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Fujioka. These are for seven positions. Yes, yeah, seven important positions. Okay, it's very important. I, I just want to support what has been negotiated for these seven positions. Is that correct? Well, there's 28 incumbents. There's, there's, yeah. there's five distinct classifications. 28 incumbents. 28 positions. Classification. Classification. Yeah, position, right. Individuals. Whatever, yes. whatever it is. Uh, members, and Mr. Zion, I don't know where Mr. Zion is. You asked the question there. You said it like uh, 30 years. It's been going on since the Zab Madre. The water is always paid more. Uh, and there was a value in this city for people who worked in water. Okay, and I remember a story from someone who works in my staff and their wonderful parents 
when they worked at the Memorial Branch of the Los Angeles Public Library across from LA High School. And everybody who was there, this is in the 1930s, these are the Fitzpatricks, they wanted to get to water and power because they always paid more, Greg, because it was the ditch diggers of the city who brought water to the Pueblo who always got paid more because we saw it as a value. Okay, so there's some of that history that goes back 100 years of water, and water pays more. Okay, now, the importance, though, of some special crafts, as you mentioned, Mr. Smith, are true. The linemen have a tremendous job uh, and a tremendously dangerous job uh, that has to be made sure there's compensated correctly for. But I want, I see Mr. Deaton join the table, and I want to ask Mr. Deaton, I have here the Los Angeles report to the city government. This was nice. I like this one page, 1947, 1948. It said where the city gets its property taxes, where the city us gets its dollar. Uh, we had 39% property taxes. We had sales taxes 11%. We had permits at 9.19%, uh, and we had water power transfer of 11, 11 cents. What's our water power transfer? I'm looking, I need my glasses, Ms. Hahn. Excuse me. Out of every, U, every U.S. dollar in 1947, 39%, 39 cents was property tax, and 11 cents was water power revenue. Do you know out of the dollar right now, how much is the water power revenue transfer out of a dollar? It's around 10%, I think. It's around 10%, so it would be right around here. Anyway, members, I think you bring up some very good points, Mr. Smith. I want to ask Mr. Deaton to elaborate a little because he has a little history of 111. Uh, no, I just uh, three. I wasn't going to uh, comment until Mr. Uh, Levine started blaming uh, Mulholland for this. I'm not blaming Mulholland. I love Mulholland. <laughs> Believe me, I'll uh, cut me over. I'll bleed Mulholland. <laughs> I, th this got cre this problem was created when the Board of Water and Power Commissioners were their own salary-setting authority, and the council set the salaries for everybody else. There was a charter change, and we've had this uh, lack of parity uh, because you basically had two bodies setting the salaries for a long period of time until about 25 or 30 years ago, and uh, the parity, as uh, as I explained to Tom. Uh, has been here at least 38 years because when I started with the city, I started with water and power because they paid more. All right, now, Mr. Deaton, I know I got 25 seconds. I want to ask Mr. Fujioka on the fact that we lose city employees like park rangers leave uh, the park ranger division of record parks and go to security at water power because they pay more. Okay, How, what can you do to investigate? Maybe having that class not frozen when we lose. I can see if it's attrition out the door, but if it's attrition from one to another, that seems to be a problem. Could you look at that and report back to us to see if there's any way to open those freeze so we don't hurt ourselves by people going that? And one other quick question. Does airport and harbor, are they out of line in what this is? Uh, no. They once were, right? They once were. Maybe some select classes, but no. to a large extent, no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robange. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things I think that's important is not only zero in on ward and power. I think for the city, if you look at airports and harbor, you have the same issue. And let, let, me, let, me, let me finish. <laughs> okay. and, and particularly when you think about in addition to salary, they, all of these departments also give additional benefits, such as educational incentives and a variety of things that other departments have do not have. Uh, within the police department one year, we started the year with 600 civilian vacancies. We hired over 800 people and ended the year with 600 vacancies because we're the, you know, the larger 24-hour departments are the hiring ground, the training ground, and then when they find out that there are educational benefits, salary benefits, eight-hour work days, no weekends, people migrate quickly once they get on the city's payroll. So I think if we're going to look at that, we have to look at all of those issues because some departments do not have the ability to give educational incentives. They cannot give five-day-a-week separate offices and par uh, private parking, all the things that make people gravitate to those jobs, and, and it causes the 24-hour operations to be in a situation that they're constantly hiring, 
transition and not being able to have a stable workforce. I agree that when there are specific issues that deal with expertise and you're competing for both governmental and private agencies for a unique specialty, then you have to give that uh, bonus so that people will not learn their skill and move on. But when we're talking about citywide classifications uh, and the other side, the, the other benefits, I think we have to look at that. Otherwise, some agencies in the city will be hiring agencies and some will always get the benefit of that because they have more benefits to give. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. I just want to close with my saying, we have met the enemy, it is us. We can continue to say, well, this is only 28 people, Mr. LeBron. We'll say it next time and next time. And so pretty soon it's hundreds of people. So you got to draw a line somewhere. Let's start. Other members wishing to be heard? If not, we have the matter before us. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes, 1 no. Welcome back, Mr. Holden. Next item. Item number 35, call special by Council Member Reyes. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. I just rise to uh, address this issue in a manner which uh, we can see how the city is trying to promote areas like Chinatown that are near rail, near rail stations. What we're doing is we're trying to take advantage of a parking lot that's underused in a part of Chinatown off of Hill Street. If we're successful, we'll be able to put together a parking facility that will support not only the Chinatown residences and businesses, but it can enhance our ability to bring in more revenue, more tourists, more business for the city of LA as it connects to the rail station. So this is an effort to be creative, to use our airspace, and to intensify mixed uses along rail corridors and rail stations like the one we find in Chinatown. I'd like to thank the staff for the hard work and our efforts to be creative and promoting these kinds of programs for these types of resources. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Other members wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 42, call special by Council Member Hahn. Ms. Hahn, item 42. Um, do I have to make a motion to open? Uh, I move that we reopen a public hearing. Okay. Uh, any objection? Well, without objection, we'll reopen the public hearing and hear from Howard Euler. Did I get that right? Euler. Mr. Euler, this is your time. Name is actually Euler. Uh, and I apologize for not being more alert, but I was in a conversation over here with some field deputy. Uh, on point number 42, I'm speaking on behalf of the Central San Pedro Neighborhood Council, for which I am the president, and Toberman Settlement House, which is one of the three or four oldest human service agencies in Los Angeles, and I'm the director of that, of that entity in San Pedro. Um, at our neighborhood council meeting two weeks ago, all of the stakeholders present, and I assure you we had a very large crowd, um, evaluated this proposal for negative impacts, and we could not find any, and know that that meeting consisted of business people who are contiguous right to that area, uh, to that block, um, faith community representatives, human service workers, people who work in downtown San Pedro, absolutely nobody could identify a single negative. The only business on that block is Ante's. There is nobody else who has to change stationery or invoices, addresses. There's no cost to any business except Ante's, and that's the cost they're willing to bear happily. Um, in terms of the neighborhood council, you should know the vote was unanimous. We probably had somewhere between 75 and 80 people in that meeting that night, and the vote was unanimous. There was nobody who opposed or abstained from approving the motion to support the changing of that one block to Ante Perkoff Way. 
Um, and again, the cross sample of that community, ethnically, professionally, the faith community branches, it was unanimous. Everybody supported it. Uh, last point I want to make in encouraging you to endorse the changing of the name to Ante Perkov's Way is the point I want to make is really a spin off of your earlier awarding and praise of this police commissioner, Mr. Bachelman, I believe is his name. Please know that Ante Tony Perkoff is held in the exact same adulation throughout the harbor, particularly in the town of San Pedro. He was the alter ego, the moral conscious, um, the most highly respected person probably next to Janice Hahn uh, in San Pedro. Uh, he just is loved, and, and that's why there was such unanimous support for, for this motion. Um, when you vote for this, if you vote in favor, please know that what you're doing is casting a vote for San Pedro's version of that American dream. Ante came here as an immigrant. Ante jumped ship. Um, he did not want to live under communism. He did not want to live in, in post-World War II Yugoslavia. He came here. He started as a busboy washing dishes in a restaurant. From there, he opened a small cafe. From there, he opened San Pedro's landmark eatery. Uh, he was probably the most generous philanthropist in that town. There isn't a charity that didn't benefit from his work and fundraising. Uh, just the most incredible human being. And so, in terms of this notion of an American dream, uh, of coming here, making this free market economy work for you, building a healthy community because of that, Ante personified that. So when you vote for this motion, and I sure hope you all vote for it, know that that's also part of what you're voting for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This concludes public comment on this item. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't say any better than Howard Mueller did. Uh, and I want to, first of all, thank Howard for it is now 5 after 12. I know you've been here since the beginning of the council meeting. I appreciate you staying um, to testify not only on behalf of the neighborhood council, but really you spoke for all of San Pedro and the harbor area in terms of our affection uh, for the late Ante Perkoff. And members, this is an example of, uh, in my opinion, how you change the name of the street uh, gracefully. Uh, it certainly uh, came from the ground up. And this is something that uh, San Pedro and the community and his family has really wanted for a long time. And I was just lucky enough uh, to be here at the time when I could use uh, uh, my influence on the City Council of Los Angeles to help uh, those in San Pedro who wanted to honor Ante Perkoff, and I'm glad to do that. It's an appropriate way to honor him. Uh, he defines the word hospitality and generosity. So thank you, Howard, and thank you to all those uh, in San Pedro, particularly to his family, uh, for wanting to honor him in this way. And all of you are welcome anytime to come down to San Pedro and eat at Ante's. Thank you. I hope you support me on this name change. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Mr. Labonge. I'm always going to support Janice Hahn when she does the great job in San Pedro uh, that she does. It was such wonderfully said uh, about this family uh, and about the meeting, and it's appropriate, very appropriate. Uh, so history uh, will again be. Uh, uh, a correctly change with this name change for a, a wonderful part of San Pedro of someone who made an impact uh, on the lives of many. Thank you, Mr. President, for this 49 seconds. Mr. Butler. Yeah, I just wanted to, to rise and also acknowledge that uh, this is great to see a community input process uh, work the right way. I want to commend the council member for involving the neighborhood councils and getting uh, the clergy community involved, getting the uh, neighborhood associations involved, and I think when government works that way, we ought to plot it and allow uh, the public to get what they're asking for. So, uh, good job, congratulations, and a rise in support. Mr. Cardenas. It's Mr. Euler, correct? Euler. I'd just like to commend you for coming forth and, and having the patience uh, to wait un until this time to, to be a part of this. I think it's more of a ceremony. I, to me, it's a ceremony because you commented about 100 percent in agreement about this uh, naming of the street Ante Perkov Way and about 
Mr. Ludlow talked about how the community got together, and including the neighborhood councils and things of that nature. It's unfortunate. I hope that I'm wrong. It's unfortunate we probably won't read about this in the press, but this is really an example of what makes this country so great. Here you have an immigrant who, who it sounds like he risked his life, risked everything to be here. And then when he got here, just said, I love this place so much that I'm not just going to take, I'm going to give, 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 give. And it sounds like this. Mr. Ante Perkov was someone who really gave and just gave and gave. And look, now we're able to eulogize him in a way that he's not even asking for anything. And here the community is willing to say he deserves it. We should give this to him in his memory. To me, whenever I see this street, whenever I'm in San Pedro, I'm going to be looking at the street and remembering everything that this man gave and what he symbolizes and what he brings out, the best that this country has to offer to say, people come here and if you put your best foot forward, you can be anything you want to be and the sky's the limit and dreams come true. And there's very few people in these chambers or very few people in this country who at one time or other didn't have someone in their family who either spoke with an accent or could hardly speak any English at all. And here we are just moving on up, doing wonderful things like this and recognizing that to me this is an, another a moment in time where we can say, God bless this country, this is a great country. Look at what people do. Thank you. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That is approved. And Mr. Cardenas? Mr. Cardenas? I think you will be reading about it in the newspaper because the Daily Breeze follows every move Councilmember Hahn makes. And they're all good moves. Uh, next item, please. Item number 43, call special by Council Member Parks. Be actually, before going on to item 43, unless there's objection, so we take item 45 out of order. I believe we can dispense with that uh, rather quickly. Ms. Misikowski, item 45. Uh, item 45 is an item that was acted on on Friday, and I think we adopted uh, A, B, and C. C was actually a substitute motion, so I just wanted to correct that. This is the Animal Regulation, Animal Services Department which had already done a pilot program. Um, this was just reinstituting and allowing the pilot program to be done in certain areas with notification. notification and uh, it will be done by city personnel to person try to get increase the registration and licensing of animals that are appropriately uh, supposed to be registered and licensed, in particularly areas where there have been problems with packs of animals running and the like. Uh, so I think it's meant to be a government reaching out and helping people and giving them information so they can become both informed and, and uh, abide by the rules that the uh, city set forth. So I ask that we approve item C, which was a substitute correcting the information which had transferred from last year with a budget item request that don't need to be accommodated this year because it was already in the budget. So I ask that we approve item C. Mr. Parks. Mr. Chair, I'd like uh, city staff to come up. Uh, one of the major items in, I think, the East and Ninth District deals with the issue of uh, dogs and uh, unlicensed and roaming the neighborhood, and I thought it would be important, being that this is a pilot uh, for the east side of the city and the south Los Angeles part, that we get a presentation so the community will know what you're going to be doing and how you're going to go about uh, enhancing the uh, licensing process in the community. Yes, sir. Uh, members of Council, Jerry Greenwald, Animal Services Department. Uh, this, uh, as uh, Council Member Mizikowski said, this uh, matter, uh, the uh, canvassing has, is included in our 2003-04 uh, budget. And, uh, this is a cleanup essentially from last fiscal year. The uh, state of California requires licensing of dogs throughout the state as uh, a precaution against rabies. Because One of our ways that we can uh, ensure or provide for licensing to the communities uh, citywide is to uh, provide for licenses. And uh, historically, not historically, over a decade now, we've uh, I 
licensed uh, animals throughout the city by a contractor. And this has been uh, less than satisfactory in that we have a great many more animals in the city of Los Angeles than we do have uh, licenses. So this will be, uh, uh, will provide the city the uh, number of the staff to uh, canvas various areas of the city. Initially, it will be a pilot program. Uh, the protocols have not been written as yet. Uh, however, uh, essentially, we will be going in to alert the pilot area that we will choose. In this uh, instance, I, I believe it's going to be in the South Los Angeles area. We will alert the uh, uh, residents of the areas that uh, in a period of time, 30 days, 60 days, or whatever we decide on at that time, uh, that we will be canvassing their areas by foot. Um, we will have uh, uh, our canvassers hired from the district, from the area from, uh, that they will be canvassing. So this will give them a, a leg up on uh, familiarity with the uh, people they will be talking to and so on. Uh, prior to our actual canvassing, we will provide a number of uh, opportunities for the residents to avail themselves of uh, free rabies vaccinations. Um, uh, we'll give them uh, areas where they can have their animals spayed or neutered so that they can save money on the licenses. And we want to get this information out to the uh, that particular district so that they are aware that there are ways that they can get their animals spayed and neutered and, uh, it, and the licenses will be only be $10. So that is our intent. Uh, as we develop the uh, informational packets that we will be uh, uh, distributing throughout the community, we'll also provide those packets of information to other areas of the city as well. So we're not going to just limit this informational, this educational uh, package to certain uh, one area only. One of the things that's important is how will you notify the community before you go out and start the pilot? We will notify them uh, through the use of council offices, the uh, local newspapers, door-to-door. Uh, -door. Our officers will also have uh, flyers available. We'll go into uh, markets, local markets, and uh, post, the, post this information. We'll go into uh, laundromats and post this information where people tend to go in and out frequently. And, and when will you determine what the actual pilot area is? Um, well, um, Mr. Councilman, the, the, the position that we're waiting to get unfrozen will be determining that area. It will be in the South Los Angeles area. That has been um, identified as the area where we have probably the, the biggest concentration of unlicensed animals and possibly the most uh, loose animals as well. If you make sure we get it notified as soon as you make that determination, then we'd be a better help to advising people. A absolutely. We'll notify all the council. Okay. The other thing, uh, just a general information for the public, where can they access information about currently about rabies or dealing with uh, the shots or dealing with the space neutering and licensing programs that currently exist? How does the community access that? They can visit any of our shelters. There. We have uh, six shelters throughout the city, uh, as well as the website, laanimalservices.com. It has all the information about where uh, rabies vaccinations and other vaccinations can be received, as well as space neutering. Is information also uh, directed to the constituent centers or the field offices for the council? Yes, we will be providing all this information uh, that gives a breakdown of everything that the city does. Well, thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to, to thank the department for putting this together and, and thank uh, Cindy Miskowski. I know this has been a strong priority of mine and, and you really shepherded this through to make sure that this would happen. And, and one of the things, Council of Parks, that this is going to be about is we're going to try to take some of the additional monies and give them to Spain neutering uh, coupons for the community as well because I think that's a critical piece of what the city needs to do to save itself future money. So I just wanted to give my personal thanks because I know I've been following this and you have done a great job of making sure this will roll out. Um, we know what the, the bar so is. I think the county does a great job. We know where we have to hit it, and, and I have full confidence that um, we'll take the best practices and implement them right here in the city of Los Angeles. So thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. The only question I have, and it's not, I'm going to vote for this to let you know that right off the bat. Um, 
But my concern is that we, we pick an area, a uh, pilot area, that's not going to be extremely economically disadvantaged because it will skew your numbers when we look at it later on and see whether the program worked well or not. So we have to pick, keep that in mind that maybe you need to look at two areas that give you a little better balance. Uh, so when we look at the analyzes later on, it really means something to us. That thing we want to bring your data. Other members wishing to be heard on this item? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 49. Thank you very much. That substitute motion is approved. Next item, please. Item number 43 is still on the desk, and that was called Special Life Health Member Parks. Uh, Mr. Parks and Ms. Wiesikowski both wish to speak on this item. Let's hear from Ms. Misikowski first. Uh, yeah, let me just present this, members. As many of you know, we had a very uh, significant debate in the city about two years ago on whether or not the department should um, adopt a flexible work schedule and allow officers to work not just the standard uh, 540 uh, shift, but allow nine hour shifts, 10 hour, actually we now have 10 hour and 12 hour shifts, three, three, 410 and 312. At that time when it was adopted, there were some issues that we debated and, and the council asked that we get regular updates as to the effectiveness of the flexible work schedule according to some criteria and indicators that we wanted to monitor. We wanted to monitor some cost indicators and some service indicators. The cost in the court indicators were court overtime. Was there going to be, was this going to increase overtime or not on, in court? End of watch overtime, which had been high previously. How is that working under the schedule? And sick time usage. There was an awful lot of information, at least on the part of the officers who were representing uh, this request, that sick time would fall off and all these other cost things would be good. The service indicators that we wanted to look at were response time, uh, crimes, how do the crimes relate to this, and arrests. And what we have before us is a status report of some of those indicators. Uh, the good news is that most of the cost indicators were going in the right direction, that is, that is we had to pay less on overtime, significant overtime costs sick time class, six, sick time is way down. Um, but then it did, uh, was presented that the service indicator analysis is somewhat more mixed. And as we discussed it quite heatedly in committee a few weeks ago, uh, the committee members said this is useful information and we need to continue to track it, but we most specifically need um, to know some other things. How does this rate to numbers of officers on patrols, the number of cars that really are on patrol, what's been going on in the distribution? As we know, as this was going forward, we also had hit some of the, the worst recruitment periods in our police department's history in, in recent times where we were really losing officers and not even maintaining parity in number of officers we were losing. That has changed in the last uh, year and a half. We've uh, really turned that around and are now increasing officers and looking to increase them even more. So the question is, where were we looking at real numbers, real other factors, and essentially the committee report, the committee re accepted and received and filed this information, and I would like to ask the department to come forward, the people who are here who presented this report, because I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, by parts of the committee. But the committee then asked that we ask the department to look at some of the other factors that we were looking, concerned about and report back. And I understand that the police commission itself has been interested in this work that was uh, begun in this report that was done for the committee and has asked that as this report for more information comes back, that, um, that it go to the commission as well. And the information that we wanted back uh, within 30 days is the number of cars and units working in a patrol division and responding to emergency calls and additionally and any other concerns the department may have regarding the flexible work schedule as it specifically relates to the increase in response time issues as it relates to the allocation of resources. Those were the concerns, those were the biggest issues that I think jumped out to us at this report and wanted us and we wanted to have more information, more detail and more dialogue and discussions with the department uh, and the commission as we look at this in terms of assessing with the department itself how we might evolve this this work schedule to be more effective and most effective in achieving all of the goals that we want, um, but not having the response time increase that we saw come forward in this report. 
So I'm asking that we adopt this, saying it's just really the beginning, it's sort of the baseline from which we'll get more information, more detail, more analysis of some things that were not covered in this report, uh, and work together with the Commission and the Department to help uh, analyze this information. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have several things I'd like to see if we could add to uh, the report. Uh, one of the things I think when we looked at the press work schedule a couple of years ago uh, with uh, a department report, we found out that although court time was important, determined if it increased or decreased, what was also as important, what was even more important, is the failure to appear rate because. We found that officers just stopped going to court. And in fact, at one time, our entire Valley Court was getting ready to uh, uh, look forward to coming and having a meeting about their lack of uh, appearance. I think we also found that things that we expect officers to do, such as qualify or their neglected duty, also moved up as relates to uh, uh, their performance. So I think not only looking at court time or overtime, we'd have to look at uh, also the failure to peer rate, neglect of duty complaints, whether up or down, failure to qualify rates, whether up or down. Also that when we talk about end of watch overtime, the expectation is that Working 12 hour shifts and 10 hour shifts, people are not out seeking overtime. It's, generally going to be, it's going to be a self solver. But one of the things that we found in looking at these issues, if you drill down a little bit more, that people seem to have more overtime on their third day of working versus uh, their second day versus their first day uh, as they went into uh, that extended watch. Uh, the other issue that uh, I think is important, although we talked about response time, we see it significantly increasing, was the available time, which is as important as anything that we do is the sense of the 740 or that 40 percent available, the need to monitor that to see how much time officers have that are not directed by radio calls. Uh, but also balancing it with the amount of response time. Uh, the issue of crime is as important to talk about part one crime as it is to talk about uh, violent crime and most importantly repressible crime because it's a direct correlation between available time and dealing with repressible crime. If you have more available time, then you're going to have a greater impact on your repressible crime. So in looking at part one, you do not get the overall picture. You really have to break it down with violent and also repressible. Uh, the other issue that's important is that uh, and not just numbers of uh, police cars or number of people assigned to the uh, different station. It's absolutely essential that we know the response units. They're the only ones that we know when they tie into the computer who's going to respond if somebody speaks in the radio. And so that is the only real criteria that we have to determine what the available units and whether patrol units are being increased or decreased. And I think with the uh, the uh, uh, patrol plan, we have the ability to model uh, and project different shifts in the sense of numbers of police officers and then compute on a model how many would police cars or response units would be produced in eight hour shifts, 10 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts uh, to give us some sense of the same number of people, how many cars would be produced out of that. And I think our history has shown that we are far better off in the sense of number of units in the field, number of response units, is a clear correlation of crime reduction, response time, and also available time. So that's our real factor. The other issues of dealing with maybe vice narcotics and other units, we can't rely on them to respond, but we need to look at response units. The other issue I'd ask, and I realize I'm a little over, is that on the July 31st, 97 report the department did and looked at 13 to 15 internal criteria operationally as far as flexibility, looking at how uh, I respond to uh, unusual occurrences, dealing with management of the basic car, basic car integrity. Those are all issues that also need to be updated and brought up to today's standards to see if we have the same criteria. Because in the 97 report, it showed that in every feature and every factor, our performance degraded as we expanded the number of uh, hours per 
unit because if it hasn't changed much in the last several years, our climb is based on segments of four-hour spurts and that the longer we're out in the field does not dictate better performance because our climb changes dramatically about every four hours. So those are things I'd ask to be added to the report so that when we get it back, we we'll give a comprehensive view of some of these issues that were relevant then and I think just is relevant today. Mr. Park, is that an amending motion? Yes, thank you. Okay, accepted as a friendly. Mr. Villarigosa. Villarigosa. Yes, um, Mr. President, members. I have a, a couple of questions. As you may know, I've had um, a concern with uh, the ramifications of, of the cost ramifications of the three-day uh, work week. And in looking at this um, study, you know, I, I'm interested, uh, I guess, in asking the um, – what was your name, excuse me? Bob Hanson. Mr. Hanson. Um, concern about it, that I don't see anywhere in this report what we look at what the impact of the flexible work schedule and I've been on record in support of, of a four-day work week but but it, particularly the three-day work week is on uh, the number of patrol officers I think it's, it's the same as the council we spoke to a few minutes ago uh, I don't see where we um, make a notation about that or uh, have evaluated the number of cars that are in bureaus at any one time, uh, what, it, what it's done to reduce the number of the person power, the staffing that we have on the streets and the like. Um, is that a part of this? Is that something I missed? Is well, I, I'm not sure. That's, that's not my report. That's the CAO's report. But I believe the report that we're going to produce will address specifically that. And I think that's a concern that many people have, has, has the number of response units as a result of the flex work schedule. Uh, been reduced. I'm not sure I have enough information today uh, to answer your question, but I believe the report will answer your question. And uh, in when you conduct this study, there's um, there's a reference here that I guess on the first page, and it says that uh, that uh, comparisons pre and post flexible work schedule comparisons are very difficult to uh, make because. Um, they're using different measurements in the pre and post area, area uh, pre and post periods. Is there a way to address that so that we're comparing apples with apples and not, you know, getting uh, information that frankly isn't reflective of what's going on? I think it is. Again, as the, the CEO is probably in the best position to answer that question, but if I can just say that we've been into the flex work schedule now in some areas for a year and a half. So I think we're getting to the point where we can make those apple to apples uh, comparison that you talk about. Yeah, one of the um, problem areas we have in terms of measuring flex was that it was phased in. Patrol officers were phased in in November 2001, and then as they were phased in, detectives and specialized units were phased in at a later time in July 2002. It wasn't until February 2003 where all patrol and detective and specialized units were all on flex at the same time. Right. So you think that uh, now that, we can, that we've had more time, uh, during which we've been able to implement the flexible work schedule, there'll be a better opportunity to evaluate this. Let me ask you another uh, thing. I noticed that the study doesn't really address the issue of community-based policing. Now, as I understand it, uh, most of the community-based police officers, the police are on four, a four-day work week. Is that correct? Ms. Lowe's? Thank yes, you. they're so, on a flexible work schedule, four-day work week. On the four-day work week. Has there been any analysis on what the impact of their work has been with respect to this schedule? That wasn't part of the scope of our study. And I'm not aware of any study that's been conducted in that regard. Well, members, I, I'd like to argue that, um, we, that we uh, look at the impact of the senior leads. Um, some people believe that we, as much as possible, I mean, they're doing a great job, as we all know. Been a long-time advocate uh, of those leads. In fact, I was on a, a um, 
right along recently and these people just have a knowledge of the district that was incredible. Um, but I, I'd like to know what the impact of, of the flexible work schedule has been on their workload, on their interaction with uh, our communities, on their ability to address um, um, crime and blight in the area, their relationships with the neighborhood prosecutor uh, and the like. In addition, I, I um, you know, at a time when, you know, I think members and Mr. President, when we all believe that we'd like to, to get more cops on the streets of the neighborhoods of Los Angeles and, um, and where our mayors actually proposed that. Uh, I believe that what we need to do is to make sure that every cop that we have currently uh, is used efficiently and uh, to a maximum level. And to the extent that this study looks at that staffing and um, allocation and, and what the best configuration is, I think it would be very helpful for the rest of us. I, I notice, uh, I guess about 18% of the officers are on uh, an eight-hour day. Mr. Uh, Villaregosa. Uh, 5%, almost 6% on a 9-hour day, 48% on a 10-hour day, and 27 on a 12-hour day. So, you know, to the extent, what's the best configuration here? You know, should it be, you know, 60% on a, a four-day work week, 10% uh, on a three-day work week? Uh, should it be, you know, everyone on a four-day work week? That kind of thing, uh, it seems to me, would be important because uh, I really don't know what the rationale. I mean, I did read through this, but it don't get a good feel for what the rationale was for allocating officers in the way that they were. And to the extent that we can evaluate that and see what's the best way to um, allocate these officers in the way on their, in the work schedule in a way that, one, keeps that morale strong, because obviously that's very important. We've seen an increase in morale. Two, yes. Um, and two, uh, keeps crime down, but uh, also uh, allocates our resources in an optimum way. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I, I think Mr. Villagrosa is right. What we, what we have before us isn't sufficient for us to come up with any conclusions, because we don't really have a full, a full scale analysis in front of us. And I just want to ask the folks at the table if you were clear, based on the discussion we had at the Public Safety Committee, about the kind of report we're looking for uh, coming back to hold my time. You can just tell us what you, what you intend to do. Everybody's looking at me. Uh, I, I think, go next. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, just from the discussion, I was at the last half of that public safety committee. I didn't, I didn't hear all the remarks, but it, I think the initial uh, emphasis of that committee meeting was to find out if, if the flex schedule was cost effective. Once response time came to be an issue, that, that became the bigger issue, I think. And so most of my uh, input has, has been received uh, as a result of that committee meeting has dealt with uh, the, uh, the the increase in response time. And, and by the way, it's not a new development. Response time has been going up for the last three or four years. And there are a lot of things that impact that. Not, and I can't at this point say that flex, the flex schedule contributes to that. We don't know yet. So uh, many of the things that Chief Par that uh, Councilman Parks uh, stated uh, will be in the report, I think, uh, similarly with uh, with uh, Councilman Villaraigosa. And as you can see here, I'm taking some vigorous notes. So I think all those things need to be incorporated. Uh, hopefully this can be done in a couple of weeks, but it sounds like it's, it's going to be quite an analysis. And, and the rest of you at the table, CAO, there's a CAO component to this as well? Yes, sir, we understand what you're after. That's, that's great, because um, I mean, when I saw that data that was presented at the Public Safety Committee, I, I understand how we got there, which is that Ms. Misikowski and I, when flex work was first implemented, we asked for reports and wanted to know what's the impact of flex work on a variety of, of factors, including response time. But then the report we got at the end didn't really analyze that. Uh, and so the question really becomes, if response time is going up in the city, and it appears that it is, what are the factors that have contributed to that? And there can't just be one factor. We know there must be several. Uh, the League put out uh, a uh, 
couple page document that suggested a number of factors that may be contributing to the increase in response time. So it's artificial to say it's just because of flex work. And I don't think anyone meant to say that. I don't think that was the intent of the report you presented to public safety. Um, but read the wrong way, it could be read to indicate that. So what we want is a comprehensive analysis of what are the factors that have caused response time to go up, and also what what other impacts are there from flex work that we should be looking at. Um, and, and a couple have been highlighted before, uh, and, and they're in the, uh, in the recommendations for council action here on the agenda. Uh, so I won't, I won't belabor them again. But that's what we're looking for because we want to be able to make public policy decisions based on a full and complete analysis. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, one thing that I want to encourage you to also consider this, and if uh, the command staff could take a look at this in the report, I'd like to know how this is affecting the morale uh, of the officers. We tend to get, I think, glossed over in terms of uh, the other details of this, but one of the key things that we've all uh, unfortunately been all too aware of is that one of our greatest challenges in increasing response time, or however you look at it, increasing or shortening it, making it quicker, is our ability to maintain a uh, staffed department. And time and time again, I think we tend to overlook the challenges of attrition. When officers feel like they come through the department, but yet they can, they come through the training, but yet they can move on to neighboring uh, departments throughout Southern California, get a better work schedule, get a better paycheck, get a better pension plan. Um, so I would like us, as we're kind of narrowing down the scope of this report, to also look at how the officers feel. How do they feel? Do they feel like this city is a place that they want to retire in? Is this a city that they want to continue to work for? And as I recall, one of the major issues that their uh, representative uh, bargaining agent raised in the advocacy for this uh, flexible work schedule was in the difficulty that the city of LA is having in retaining competent, capable officers. And so as we begin to dissect this in many, many ways, I don't want uh, the members of this body or anybody else in the city to forget that the men and women who patrol the streets of the city are at the foundation of having a great police department. If we want officers out on the streets, we want officers to respond, we are in fact going to have to find a way to make sure that we're keeping them here. So their morale, I think we need to raise that as an issue as, as important as any other dynamic facing police response time. Thank you. Mr. Zayn. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues, and uh, Mr. Ludlow, I appreciate those comments coming from that organization. Morale is definitely a factor, and I think you'd have a mutiny in the organization if you took away the flex schedule. But uh, arrests are up, Commander. The court time is up because arrests are up, which means officers are spending more time in court, which means they're getting more overtime, which means they would have time off because of FLSA. And while the number of officers have increased, the ones we've absorbed from the MTA, the expansion of the department, the Homeland Security, the gang enforcement teams have drained personnel. The consent decree has drained personnel. And I think if we look at the number of bodies handling radio calls, the number of bodies in the black and white responding to radio calls, that number has reduced while these other factors need to be taken into consideration. Whether it's 8-hour, 10-hour, or 12-hour, all those factors play a role. But when you don't have the gang enforcement team officers or the bike patrol officers handling radio calls, our response time is definitely going to increase. And I know certain divisions in the city that have a deployment of 10 basic cars, sometimes they're running six and seven basic cars. And when those six and seven basic cars are deployed on day watch and officers are going to court, there may be two to three basic cars handling until a mid watch takes over. So there's a lot of factors that comes into play. And I know that there are critics on the flex schedule, whether it be a 410 or 312, but all these other factors have to be fed into dissecting what the problem is. But I know from my perspective, that morale is up <laughs> considerably for a whole variety of factors. We've got more personnel in the organization, not only from what we absorb from the MTA, but 
the continuing hiring, the continuing recruitment. Uh, and I think it really does a disservice to say that flex schedule is the devil in this whole concept. But numbers that I've seen, arrests have gone up in some areas, multi, I mean, numbers that are not imaginable. That takes those people out of the field. And when they're booking at jails, and some divisions don't have a jail, the commute to go back and forth, that all has to be part of the equation. And I think when you analyze it, you're going to find out that they're making Los Angeles a safer place, but at the same time, a lot of those people handling radio calls aren't there. But we neglect the narcotics activity, we neglect the gang activity, so we can respond to radio calls, because the officers and those other details, I understand, are working 410. I don't know anybody who's working eight hours anymore, but it's either 410 or 312. And all those entities, none of those entities, are handling radio calls. And it just falls on what we used to call the backbone of the department which they're supposed to be the main thrust of the department, but oftentimes that's not the case. So if those other areas can be included, the numbers of arrests, the numbers of uh, the time it takes to book, the number of hours in court, that all detracts from the personnel who are available to respond to the people's need for calls in the city. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. I just wanted to, to give perhaps a warning or a request that this report uh, be based on facts and hopefully not be based on perhaps a preempted expectation of what the outcome of this report is going to be. Having been a former engineer, it was disastrous whenever we would see or have to read through a report or some type of analysis or some type of research where all of a sudden halfway through we realized that the person was actually preempting, trying to justify something that was in their mind, or they had something on their mind that they wanted to justify through the facts. And as Dennis Zine uh, pointed out, it's an extremely complicated system that you're analyzing here. You're analyzing the system, that, whether it be you know a hotter summer last year versus two summers ago, or what have you, that may have an effect on arrests and things of that nature. All kinds of factors that are really not so much in and of themselves easy to quantify or qualify scientifically. But I'm hoping that this report will, in fact, be a, a report based on facts that it be comprehensive and unfortunately uh, not be based on the sexy issue of what kind of flexible work schedule or what may have had the uh, greatest effect on how we're policing and whether or not our response time is up or down. So I just wanted to say I hope that when this report is actually finalized and hopefully we get it done in a timely manner, uh, because time is in fact of the essence that it, it, that it be done as comprehensively as possible. And I hope that those who are compiling the report uh, come, to, uh, come to the committee the chairwoman let her know if, in fact, it's getting so complicated that you need more time. Uh, because it, to have the appropriate report and to be done in the most scientific manner possible in this setting, I'm sure it's hard to be as scientific as possible because you're dealing with so many humanistic, humanistic factors and factors that are not quantifiable or qualifiable in the strictest sense. So hopefully we can do that and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you won't be uh, mired with rhetoric or, or too much press about the report before it comes out, as we've seen all too often in the political arena, and they allow you to do your job. So hopefully we can do that, and then we can get the real facts on the table. Thank you. Ms. Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the preparers of the report, as you proceed in uh, putting together your assessment of, of the impact of this program on the officers, I want to request that you add in another component, which is community outreach uh, through not just the CPAP, but uh, the block clubs, neighborhood immediately based neighborhood organizations, uh, CDOs, to find out how this program has impacted the community in terms of response time. Um, I know that in 77th and in Newton, uh, which I share with Council Member Parks, uh, we continue to have significant, significant complaints about uh, the increase in response time to um, violent crime, um, and I believe the numbers will bear me out that uh, both uh, CD9 and CD8 have the highest numbers of violent crime in the city, and uh, ours, our numbers do not, uh, are not going down. Um, 
So basically, the issue is the availability of officers to the community and uh, that impact. I know the shooting that occurred uh, at 43rd and Mudlong, uh, the two ladies were shot on their front porch, a man was killed in the alley. The two officers who actually uh, caught that uh, individual said that they, they happened to be in the area and driving by, and that the reason that they actually caught that individual is because the neighbors helped to direct the officers to where he was running. Um, so it's a problem that uh, doesn't seem to be getting any better for our districts. And I hope that you'll come back with some statistical information on that. Thank you. Ms. Mistikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this has been a good discussion, colleagues. I think there's a lot of good information. The report, I think, uh, might be somewhat burdensome, but that's fine. Let's get as much information as we can reasonably quickly. As I said, when we did this report, and again, it was mostly done by the CAO, and the reason it was mostly done by the CAO early on is our first, our first concerns were costs. Are we going to do something that's going to cost the city budget a lot? So that was sort of the first line of concern. The second line of concern and all its complexities are what was discussed around the table. Um, some of the issues in the past on the, as the issues of morale and not being able to retain officers and, and, and going through training and having them leave have changed. Those were problems. But for instance, last year in the budget, we expected to lose 600 officers by uh, attrition and retirement. We lost. I don't think we hit 400. That's because the officer morale is up, but let's look at it more scientifically. Um, we don't have one flex work schedule that everybody's on. As Mr. Villaraigosa said, we have now up to 18 percent on the eight-hour shift. The best shift, and the one that everyone seemed to like a lot, was the 10-hour shift. And the 410 is now 48 percent of our department. That's the best. The more that we can move towards that, I think we're going to be in good shape. I also think Mr. Villaraigosa is right to look at the senior leads, because that's dealing with the issue that Mr. Parks talked about, which is the available time, the time that is not dealing with part one, part two crimes, but the repressible time, the time that if you're out there not just chasing a call, you're out there because you know the, department, the, the area you're working in, your, your you know, antenna are up, you can start doing more proactive police work which was the basis of whatever patrol is out there, that you're not spending your whole patrol time just answering radio calls, you're doing patrol time being more like senior leads. So as much as we can factor as, mu as much of that in, and some of it will be empirical, some of it will be real, I think we will have a much better picture to guide us, to guide the department, to guide the commission, and I appreciate the police who have been here and its members listening to this discussion, because they too want to work with the department in everybody's best interest to really make this the best department, the best capable department for response with the officers' morale as a factor, fighting crime the first factor, responding to citizens who are putting those calls in a factor, putting it all together to make it work in the best way we can. And I think that uh, where we are now after this kind of report back is going to give us all that kind of information from which we can make much more enlightened and hopefully productive decisions. Thank you, Ms. Mistikowski. Other members wishing to be heard on the side? If not, then we have the matter before us as amended. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Next item, Mr. President, there is a special one on the desk. Uh, Presented by Councilmember Perry, seconded by Councilmember Parks, and the City Attorney will speak to the findings. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll read into the record the findings for Council to consider. Since the posting of today's agenda, the Phillips Temple Community Development Corporation has informed the City of its intention to apply for SIDLAC funds. Immediate action is required due to the July 16th application deadline. Pursuant to Government Code, Council must first determine whether, whether there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of Council after the posting of today's agenda. If such a finding is made, Council may consider the substantive motion. Members wishing to be heard on the findings. On the findings, seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the findings. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Special one now before us. Ms. Perry. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. This is a project that has been over a decade in the making uh, by Phillips Temple. And it will be a much needed uh, senior housing project in uh, the Central Avenue community. And uh, this is a, another effort for us to make sure that they uh, get all of the financial support that they need to finally move this project forward. So I hope that I have your unanimous support today. Thank you. Other members wishing to be heard on special one? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. For the quiz, please. Next item. This is the time for comments from the public on items not on Council's agenda. And we don't have requests from members of the public to address the Council today under public comment period. Public comment, therefore, for today is closed. Mr. Smith. S number 35, go forth with, please. Forth with on item 35. Mr. Weiss. He read your mind. Next item, please. Uh, council has motions for posting and referral. Motion shall be posted and referred. There is an excuse on the desk. Council President Padilla requests to be excused Friday, September 12th to leave at noon personal business that meets council policy. Excuse granted. And that clears the desks. Okay. Colleagues, do you have any announcements today? Mr. Garcetti for an announcement. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out to Lotus Festival. I know we had Councilman Villaragosa there, Councilman Reyes. I really want to thank you especially for putting up a great team this year. And uh, Councilman LeBond was there too. And I just want to give my apologies to your entire staff for kicking your butt on the water. Thank you. Uh, uh, he was not speaking about me. He was not speaking about the point of information. So clarify, it, Mr. Garcetti. And he's not here to defend himself. Mr. Garcetti, we'll take this matter up Other announcements? Call it, any other announcements? Do you have a journey motion today? Do we have any adjourning tributes today? If I can ask everybody to please stand for adjourning motions. Mr. Cardenas. Regret to uh, of the passing of Arnoldo Milanes, who passed away July 11th. Uh, this year, Mr. Milanes died this past Friday after being crushed between two trash trucks at the Puente Hills landfill. He worked for Perez Transport in, out of Sun Valley, and he lived in Silmar, and um, he survived by his wife and his child, and uh, we regretfully adjourn in his memory and our hearts and prayers go out to his, his family. Mr. Garcetti. Yes, colleagues, I ask that we adjourn in excuse, memory of two 95-year-old musicians who passed away in the last uh, couple days. One of them, of course, is Benny Carter, the legendary saxophonist, um, composer, jazz musician, and band leader. Um, he was probably one of the greatest saxophonists we had um, in the jazz era. He uh, played for eight decades, um, died this Saturday in his sleep at Cedar sinai Medical Center following a brief illness, uh, bronchitis. Um, he was somebody who uh, was probably one of the most proficient players who really knew how to take some of the most simple lines and imbue them with some of the strongest feelings of any jazz musician I ever listened to. And I'm sure maybe at another meeting, Mr. LeBange probably has a, a good Benny Carter album that we can bring in and listen to. Um, he played the alto saxophone, one of the clearest players. Um, that ever existed, but he was also um, one of the first blacks to succeed on the musical side of the film industry, too, and sometimes is not um, uh, given enough credit for that. Also, um, Compay Segundo, who uh, was the eldest musician on the Buena Vista Social Club uh, album, but who was a longtime uh, player as well in Cuba, um, somebody who was kind of a senior ambassador of Cuban culture, as he was described in LA Times, also passed away on Monday. Um, uh, he is uh, somebody who established his uh, playing in so many different styles, whether it was kind of swing or more traditional Cuban music, but somebody who uh, played, he also sang um, the, the bass lines that sometimes you hear in Cuban music. 
uh, that are the harmony underneath underneath the main melodies, but a voice who uh, will be very, very sadly missed, but one that we will continue to listen to, but two 95-year-old musicians who uh, change the world with their music. Mr. Levant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti, for that. Uh, I'd like to ask you to adjourn the memory of Alma Perez Nazarian, who was a Long-time member of the Los Feliz community, very involved with the local schools, Ivanhoe King and John Marshall. Uh, she had a uh, uh, daughter, Kathy, and a son, Michael. Uh, she was well-loved by many and a member of our mother of Good Council Church and just a good citizen of this city who uh, is now with her maker. So we ask that you join in memory of Alma Perez Other tributes? Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as we adjourn in memory of Jeffrey Colin Nicholson, who's the owner of the Parlay Barbershop and Sports Bar on Manchester Avenue in Los Angeles, and recently won uh, a local award as the best barbershop in the region through Steve Harvey's City Awards. He died on Sunday, July 6, 2003, from a gunshot wound. He was just 38 years old. Uh, he was born in Los Angeles, December 20th, 64, attended Woodcrest Elementary, Bret Hart Junior High, and Reseda High School. Later, he attended the uh, Harbor Occupational School, where he received a certificate in uh, appliance overhaul and repair. Uh, in the last 10 years of his short life, he successfully owned and operated two businesses along with his wife, Paula. He was preceded in death by three of his siblings, Lisa, Andrew, and Lori. He leaves his wife, Paula, and son, Ronnie, and a host of other relatives. Other tributes? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned.